Is it 2018 already? Postdoc, the New Orleans ACS meeting is coming up. I need data. Again. Um, yeah, I got I got a little bit of data uh, to present, but, you know, I, I really need some new equipment. New equipment. Hmm. Well, time to make it rain. Damn. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Woo! Nice. Nice. This is awesome. You have no excuses now. Uh. Yeah. everyone. How are you all doing? I hope everybody is doing all right today. Yes. Welcome to another Ask Us Anything About Electrochemistry live stream. I'm Alex Caro. This is my colleague, Dr. Neil Spinner. I guess I'm also a doctor too, but yes, you are. Just, just call me Alex. We're doctors, but like, you know, if you're suffering from like a stroke or something, we're mostly useless. Yeah. We're not that kind of doctor. Yeah. But if you happen to have an electrochemistry problem, That's right. And you're on the floor, and it's just like, why is my impedance not working? Yeah. Like if, if you're, if you you're call in doctor, severe pain, and then the only thing you really want to know is how a battery works, I'm your guy. Yes. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> so welcome everybody to the to the live stream. This is where uh, you have a chance to ask us uh, any questions at all about electrochemistry. We're going to try our best to answer them. Um, we get a lot of questions from either email, YouTube, webinars, um, and just, just messages to us directly. And some of these questions are pretty technical, and those formats are not always the best to answer them. So we've created this live stream where you can ask us anything, and it really gives us a chance to go into more detail about some of these electrochemistry questions. So uh, the format is we usually do this for about two hours. Um, that's actually been kind of the running average, actually. And uh, type any questions you want into the chat. Uh, we're using Restream as a, a platform for uh, broadcasting onto YouTube. We've settled into this now. You yeah. Know, for like five, six weeks in a row, we were like, we're just trying stuff. Yeah. You know, we'll see what sticks. And uh, we really like Restream. We really like Restream. Shout out to Restream, great platform. Yes. We use some other good platforms, but uh, this one, it's, I, we're really lucky. Yeah. Yeah. We, re we really like this. And, um, and we, we've noticed very, little delays between what we say um, and when it actually uh, pops up. I think it's still like maybe 10, yeah, 20 seconds. 10, 15 seconds, something. that's not too bad. So if you, uh, so if you hear, uh, so if you type something in and we don't immediately respond to it, uh, don't, don't be alarmed. And um, again, you can ask us any questions. There are no stupid electrochemistry questions, please. Uh, Ecam is very difficult, so feel free to ask any and all questions, and we'll try to get to them as soon as possible. Um, we, uh, if you're unable to, or, or if you watch the live stream later after we've gone live, um, we will have in the description of this video uh, a list of all the questions with timestamps so that you can you can ask. We're going to also apologize in advance if we mispronounce anybody's names. Um, or just whatever number of things come up in, uh, uh, you know, just whatever a YouTube username is. Uh, I think one time someone's username was a Pokemon and I just had no idea. Yeah, that was fun to learn. That was fun that to was learn. Really fun. Hey, by the way, somebody in the chat, let us know that you can hear this. I was just playing with the audio settings and realized it was, it might have been like, it wasn't on our audio input until shortly just now yeah so it's possible that your voice was coming through like my computer yes yeah, i don't know if what alex was just saying was you could all hear or, uh, or maybe it was sounded far i think hopefully the microphones we're using now should be the things you're hearing i hope yeah so yeah. anyway for the next 20 or 30 seconds somebody please just sort of say i can hear both of you we would appreciate it uh to know that 
the things that we try to say to answer your questions will be heard by you and useful. Yes. So sorry yes. to interrupt. Yeah, no, 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 that's good. I think that that's actually most of the, the kind of boilerplate list of things. Uh, during the during the live stream, just type in the questions into the chat and we'll try our best to get through them and and explain them. Mm. All right, so it looks like a we got a couple of questions. We have a couple already. customs, which is good. <clears throat> Audio sounds good. It sounded like the mic in the middle was maybe on, but it's now good. Yeah, the we do have this as a, we've had guests or um, for those occasions where we might have yeah. a, a, a I don't know guest with us. We have the third mic. Hopefully, it won't pick up any auxiliary sound or something. I do think that. Ferris, what you were hearing might have been again. I, I stupidly didn't get the audio settings before we started. Yeah, <laughs> to the I right also thing. Plug this too. So uh, I think anyway, you, you can hear both of it. Thank you, B. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah so you. anyway, I just I should have checked with that beforehand, but uh, you know, it's like I've never done this before. So <laughs> um, okay. Yeah. So um, what did you want to handle the ones that we had in yeah. chat now? Probably stuff. Yeah, yeah. We have a couple from a, a comment. I think that you can answer maybe afterwards. But um, yeah, yeah, we can look at this so afterwards. So this is from. Um, Himanshu, and Himanshu is asking, "Hi, please explain Tafel, butler volmer and Nernst equations. Explain the electrochemistry of batteries." Well, that's not too much. Yeah, yeah, it's not, yeah. nothing much. Just, uh, yeah, it's just yeah, no a big deal. Uh, <laughs> why don't uh, do you want to? I mean, I can talk about obviously the battery thing. Do you want to? I can talk. Well, I can talk about any. Do you want? Do you want to yeah. like split this up so that it's not just me talking? Yeah, for yeah, we can we can do that. Um, I'm. Fairly, I'm I'm very comfortable with the Nernst equation. Um, Why don't you do the Nernst equation? I'll do Butler, Volmer, and Tafel. Yeah, yeah. I've done those with my with webinar <clears throat> stuff. I, I can get some materials if need be. Yes. Yeah. I, it's like I understand the Butler Volmer equation, but of course I've got. I think we all have beef with some parts of these. Well, Tafel's <laughs> Tafel's my triggering yeah <laughs> thing. So so you've you've got me uh, triggered here talking about Tafel. Yeah. Slope. So wow, yeah, you're good with it. You're really good with the Nernst equation. Why, why don't yeah. you talk about Nernst, Nernst equation? Nernst equation is my is like my favorite equation of all. Nah, I shouldn't say that, but um, but what I'm gonna do it's is I will at least share my screen and um, let me open this up so that people can see. All right, and just make sure. That okay, and then yep, there we go. Right. Un un yeah, show the those. comment there. Yep. <clears throat> so right now, let me just start off by at least drawing or writing out the Nernst equation. I'm actually going to mostly focus on the, I guess the generic, the more generic form of the Nernst equation. But the Nernst equation, uh, generally speaking, is the um, the electrode potential is equal to the standard potential and then let me just make sure because sometimes they have like either plus or minus it looks like they have minus in this form i'm actually just looking at wikipedia so minus uh minus rt and then i think it's n f and then it's the natural log of basically the reaction quotient so it depends if you're doing like an oxidation or reduction reaction but you'll have let's just say um forgot which one it will be but the concentration or the activity of i believe they have it as uh read yeah they start with the like the reduced form over the oxidized form and i think this is when you're doing a, this is for the case when you have something like let's see products of reactants so re is in equilibrium with an electron plus uh, uh, whatever o OX ox. Okay, all right. So this is the <laughs> so now that we got the Nernst equation down on paper, I can at least start talking a little bit about this. So you'll commonly see the Nernst equation, um, even discussed in general chemistry, as as kind of the quintessential electrochemistry equation and. You can think of this in, in many ways, but basically it's saying that the potential, let's just say the potential of this oxidation reduction reaction, right? This one, this one, uh, I'm going to use green as a highlighter. This, this one here, where the potential of this reaction is equal to the standard or the formal potential. Sometimes you'll even see uh, the Nernst equation written with like a, a little, like, uh, actually, no, the, that would go there. 
um, the formal potential or something with like a little like accent on it that refers to it being like the standard react potential or the formal potential, which has to do with if, whether it's at standard conditions. But basically you have this formal potential minus uh, the gas constant, uh, universal gas constant times the temperature over N is the number of electrons transferred and F is Faraday's constant times the natural log of the concentration of the reduced species which is products over the oxidized species, which is um, the reactants. Now, technically, this is activity. Um, so you may you may see it put in this form um, where there's like these alphas. Uh, and Tim. So so basically, um, so it would be like alpha of uh, of like R E. And um, alpha of sorry, all alpha of O X, something like that. Um, and we can talk about activities later, but that's more of a general chemistry concept. But it's basically the effective concentration. All right. So I've just described the um, just what the Nernst equation is. And what this is really telling us is that the concentration, it relates concentration of species to the potential. I just want to make sure I, if there's any uh, feedback from people, I want to make sure that I'm not missing uh, anybody's comments. But yeah, it's basically telling us that the potential, it, it relates the potential to the concentration or the activity of redox species in solution. So this is uh, this is very interesting and very important. So when you're doing things like cyclic voltammetry, as you sweep the potential, all right, and you have current, you have voltage or potential, depending on what this voltage is, will tell you what the concentration of species are in your solution. Now, the interesting thing that we think about when it comes to the Nernst equation is we always think of this as the electrode potential that, oh, I am changing the electrode potential of, say, a glassy carbon disk, and I'm changing the concentration of species in solution as I adjust the potential, right? But you can also think of this the other way, where if you have a platinum wire alone in solution, and this is kind of the way I, you know, so let's say you have some solution. Again, I can't draw very well, but you just have platinum wire in the solution. But I have a mixture of these of these species. If I have a mixture of these species in this solution, it's going to change the potential of that platinum wire, right? So now this platinum wire's potential is related exactly to the concentration of species. So a potentiostat can affect the potential of the wire to change the species, but the species can also change the potential of that platinum wire. So, um, and additionally, one of the more important things, uh, last thing I'll, I'll mention is that uh, this is also kind of representative of why we see things like 59 millivolt peak splitting or, or differences between um, between species, sometimes we'll see peak splitting of 59 millivolts. It really comes from this. Every 59 millivolts, you'll get like this. This reduces or simplifies to like 0 0.0059 volts, right? And so that comes down to 59 millivolts or 0 0.000. I can't remember which which one, but um, but basically that means every 59 millivolts, there's an there's almost an order of magnitude difference between the concentration of reduced species and oxidized species. So that's also something just to keep in mind. And that is the Nernst equation kind of in a in a nutshell, which I, <clears throat> I hope that's uh, I hope that's helpful. All right, let me share and I'll talk about uh, Butler, Volmer and Tafel. What am I doing here? Window, let's see. Yeah, that one. Okay, are we sharing? Mm -hmm. Sharing is caring. All right, good. So the Butler-Volmer equation is an equation that describes current, okay? Current as a function <clears throat> of a few different things, but namely current as a function of potential and specifically over potential. And so you can think about potential if you want in the ways that Alex just talked about it with the Nernst equation, but the Butler-Volmer equation but I should do that every time I do this. Butler, I should use the uh, 
text box and I don't. Butler Volmer equation. So the current I is equal to I zero. This is called the exchange current density. Um, or the exchange current, really. It doesn't necessarily have to be density. Um, and this is like an intrinsic quantity that is related to the specific electrode and the reaction in the system you're studying. Okay. And then there's this expression here. And so we have an exponential. What is it? E to the, I'm going to make sure I, it's alpha NF over RT. Yeah. Okay. So we have E to the alpha NF over RT times the over potential. That's eta, the Greek letter eta. And then it's minus the same thing. What is it? Minus uh, alpha minus one, right? That's where that's where the that's yeah, it is. I, yeah. Yeah. Alpha it's minus cool. one. I'll talk about what each of these means in just a second, but I just want to write it, make sure I get the uh, the the uh, Butler Volmer equation like Alex just basically did with the Nernst equation is one of those that the 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 form of it can take some slightly different yeah. um, forms depending on where you see it and, and stuff like that. This might be a minus. The minus might be over here. This might, the alpha depends on how you define alpha. That's a big thing in the uh, world of electrochemists, what they want to call alpha and whether it's whatever it means. Anyway, I'm going to use this form for my description today. So this is the exchange current density, I0. I'm not going to type everything out here, but um, alpha is the symmetry, basically the symmetry coefficient. So normally alpha, if we have a perfectly symmetrical process, is 0 0.5. So obviously alpha and alpha minus 1, in that case, um, are, are, the, are the same, basically. Right? Um, I think I have one uh, thing off. Isn't it minus? What I have is one that, of these should be a minus. I'm missing a minus sign here somewhere. Um, alpha or, minus or, one. Or let me see. Um, you know, there's, there, there are several forms of the Butler Volmer. And I'm trying to make sure I write. I think I got it. I got it right. Alpha minus one so. NF over RT times the over potential. Yeah, I got it right. I got it right. Yeah. So, okay. Um, sorry, where am I going here? Yeah, back here. Okay, so you normally alpha is 0.5. Um, and uh, yeah, so you'd have basically 0.5 here and minus 0.5 here. So these don't cancel, right? It, it, it looks like this is going to be zero, E minus E. This is so that you know, normal situations, this is this will be 0.5 and this would be minus 0.5. Okay, yeah. so that's typically what you get. N number of electrons, F is Faraday's constant, ideal gas constant, R, T temperature, just like Alex talked about the nurse equation. Mm -hmm. This is the over potential that is E minus E zero. How far are you from that potential Alex talked about with the nerds? That standard conditions, whatever. How far away from you? Are you really high, higher than it? You're doing an oxidation. Are you lower than it? You're doing a reduction. Okay. That's that's just the distance. That's what that's what the over potential is, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Now I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna use, I actually have an Excel sheet here I'll share to show you what mm -hmm. it looks like with the Butler Volmer. Uh, Butler Volmer equation. And also, I know that there's some follow-up questions to like the Nernst equation. We'll we'll get to that after yeah. we just we, we try talk to get about through them. each of these briefly. Right? Yeah. These are some of the foundations of electrochemistry. So yeah. these, are, these are good questions. Like <laughs> yeah, the butler volmer equation, the Cottrell equation, the Nernst equation. These are like what yeah. electrochemistry is the stuff it's made out of, right? Mm -hmm. So the butler volmer equation takes this form. It's basically it'll be flat around zero mm -hmm. over potential. So when you're right at the standard potential, you're not doing anything. If you go really higher than it, and again. Convention wise, I'm doing IUPAC, UPAC convention. Positive potential is positive current is oxidation. Right. Negative current is negative potential is, is reduction. That's yeah. um, the correct way to do it. Yeah. That's, that's the way I prefer. That's the way, I, frankly, I think most of the world uses it. But if you're yeah. confused at this, it's probably just it would be flipped if you're thinking the Texas convention or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, as you increase the over potential positively, you induce an oxidation, the current increases exponentially because of the form of the Butler Volmer equation, right? E to the NF, blah, blah, blah. But the E to the over potential is what is in there. So that increases exponentially and vice versa. As you decrease over potential, you, you, you're you increasing the driving force for reduction. You have an exponential increase or decrease, depending on how you want to call it, in the current the other direction. So like these blue curve here, um, in this orange curve, these are just different exchange current densities. That first I zero term, depending on what that is, it depends on how, where this will start 
shooting on both ends up or down. That's what that constant does. Now, these are symmetrical, right? These are going up and down at the same place. That's because alpha is 0.5. If I change alpha for one of these, let's just say I do 0.3 and then you'll see 0.7 would be the other one. So if I, if I change and change the symmetry, you see what happens. This is a, this is basically an, a, a preferentially reduct reducing, you know, it's mm -hmm. not like symmetrical energy barrier. I'm, I'm neglecting some discussion of what that really actually means. Just take it for what it's on the surface right now. It's the symmetry, it's it, this, yeah. this sort of energetically will prefer reduction. You can see it's not, you, I have to go much higher. Uh, this graph I'd have to push higher, right. To, to see oxidation, but I, I have more reduction. So this is like an asymmetrical example of the butler volmer equation yeah okay so 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 there's there's an example of the butler volmer equation it's like a little fly that's right near my face <laughs> and it's driving me insane and so yeah sorry that's what that's what's happening yeah, it's all, okay. all, all, um <laughs> good lord okay so the taffel equation um is a where is it sorry i'm trying to say Go back to my other, there it is, this one, okay. Um, the Tafel equation is a rearrangement of the Butler-Volmer equation. So what we do is we basically take the Butler-Volmer equation, which is right here, and we just say, I don't care about that. And we ignore <laughs> one half of it, right? So the Butler-Volmer equation, like one half of the Butler-Volmer equation is I equals I zero E to the alpha N F over R t times eta or over potential all we do is solve for that okay i'm not going to do this math out because that would take a while um if you're really interested um i'm very sorry that you love math so much actually, <laughs> I, lo I actually like math too i'm only yeah. i'm only teasing it's actually very disingenuous of me i really like math anyway i'm not going to do all that right now suffice it to say that when you solve this thing i swear I, this little bug we need we need to have a banana like over yeah, here. Yeah, get me what fight. is it like the vinegar thing? Vinegar? You know, it's like one little tiny thing is enough to just irritate the pants off of me. Yeah. Good lord, go away, go eat something somewhere else. So Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm busy. Okay, when you solve for there's the a chemistry to be learned right here. I know you're interrupting. I can't do taffel stuff with a little fly driving me insane. Man. Okay, so it was RT over alpha NF. I'm copying it from another slide. I'm cheating. Yeah. Over alpha and uh, basically when you when you when you just rearrange this, you have to take yeah. the you know you take natural the natural log, log of both sides. sides and you usually get it into log base ten. So it's log of you end up with a the log base ten of e. Sometimes you'll see this was it two point three number. Yeah. Because yeah. one over the log of e is two point three. That's that's where that comes from. Sometimes they'll 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 say uh, two point three r t over alpha and f so you'll see that those are basically that's the taffel equation and then uh, there's another term i'm missing I, I know i'm kind of going through this quickly here but um essentially three r t over alpha and f that's alpha times the log of i and it's actually i k so I'll, I'll explain that in a moment, which is why the Tafel equation is useful and why people misuse it. This is basically the Tafel equation. So you can see there, there's another term plus you'll, yeah. you'll end up with another term. I'm going to ignore it for now. The point is, this is where Tafel slope comes from. When people make a Tafel equation, uh, sorry, when people make a Tafel plot, I'm going to do some of this and get rid of some of this stuff. Very good lasso. Make room. Yeah, there we go. All right, lasso. lasso tool. When people make a taffel plot, they plot uh, over potential versus log of current, right? And so this is just why. Right? So if you have y versus x you can get the tafel slope this is what the tafel slope is that's mm -hmm. what people get it and so they have their whatever and they get the tafel slope and that's there it is that's that's sometimes called b which is not to be confused with this b 
so because people didn't think very clearly when we did this. <laughs> they're like, hey, you know that y equals mx plus b? Well, let's call slope b. So a plus b, some whatever. So baffle slope, sometimes called b. Uh, it's 2.3 RT over alpha and F. And so it's a way for you to, um, sometimes people use it to get the N, the number of electrons transferred for like oxygen reduction reaction should be four. Sometimes it's two. So that, that's one of the um, uh, things that people will, you will use this for and gets you kinetic information about the mechanism. Can also get you an estimate, for example, about the alpha, you know, how symmetrical is yeah. my, right? so there's, there's a lot of uh, kinetic information that's buried in there. Here's my uh, triggering thing that I'm going to be very uh, clear about here with TAFL. People very frequently make TAFL slopes, TAFL plots, incorrectly and improperly. There's the one thing here that I'm missing and I didn't draw on purpose. This is K, I, K. You can't just take a CV or an LSV and then do a TAFL transform. Well, you can, <laughs> but, but you shouldn't because that's not TAFL information. What's buried in the TAFL information is that it came from the Butler-Volmer equation. I rearranged the Butler-Volmer equation in terms of overpotential. This is not I. I lied to you. This is IK. The Butler-Volmer equation is an equation that describes the kinetics only of an electrochemi electrochemical reaction, right? The Nernst equation is the thermodynamics, basically, only, right, of the electrochemistry experiment. The Butler-Volmer equation is kinetic information. There is no electrochemical system that is only kinetics. There's thermodynamics, and there's diffusion, and there's other stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you do a cyclic voltammogram or a linear sweep voltammogram or LSV anything, that current that you get from your potential stat is not kinetic current. It's just current, right? So you're making a very big and often incorrect assumption that I can make a TAFL plot from my I and E data. That's not kinetic current. So you should you should think carefully about that if there's a way to isolate the kinetic current from the current yeah under some conditions like rotating electrodes is a way to do that but that's why the TAFL plot is often misused because it shouldn't you, sh you 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 must have pure kinetic information for that slope to mean anything mm -hmm. you know you might get an express you might get a relationship between over potential and log of current but it's not TAFL if it's not kinetic. You know, and then you just have some strange plot that might be interesting, but it doesn't give you TAFL information. Yeah. So I, that drives me insane. Yeah. So that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Because there's also like, you know, there's Faraday, there's non Faraday current. There's just current that can come from all kinds yeah, of things. Yeah, exactly. And it's all in contained into that eye, right? Yeah, it's, it's all, all one. contained in that eye. Yeah. So, so okay. That's, I'll, that's really I'm going to step down from well, my soapbox and then we'll <laughs> continue here. Yeah, uh, I want to, for some reason, I think like when I adjusted Restream's like size, I lost some of the chat, but I wanted to. Oh, I have it here. I wanted to just, um, if you could share, Ferris just had a quick like elaboration. He wanted to ask mm. about the elaboration of the um, I'll show it here. natural log. Yeah, so when I was talking about the Nernst equation. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a very interesting question. I don't know if there's actually a uh, a good answer to it but like there's typically always some kind of like redox reaction or charge or some species like some people will take say if you take a platinum wire in solution and there's no oxidation or reduction reactants or something like that does does the does the platinum itself have no e naught or does it have no potential and the answer is no it has has some potential it has something but um, but it may be based on other things. So there's electrolyte, you know, you're in a solvent, right? So your solvent itself also has, um, you know, there's just like even the hydrogen, um, uh, the hydrogen evolution reaction, just like H2 or uh, 2H plus to uh, hydrogen gas, right? Like that's a reaction that's in solvent, that's in some solution. That's also part of it. But what people can do is they can actually control the potential of a of a metal electrode or something like that by adding um, a, a redox species to it, and they can adjust the concentration of the oxidized and reduced forms so that you can you can determine like all right what's the the E naught or the Fermi level, um, like the Nernst equation 
in some ways is related to like, you know, the Fermi level of the metal electrode or, or, or a semiconductor material or something like that. So I hope that um, gives you, Ferris, a little bit more elaboration on that part of the, uh, of the Nernst equation. The last part of that question too, that we just did the nerds and the Butler Bomber and the top yeah. of stuff was explain electrochemistry of batteries. So no, <laughs> um, I, that, that's a loaded question. I, I, I want to get to other people's questions. If, yeah. if there, if we get through these other ones, I can briefly like explain how a, a battery works. Um, but just in the interest of getting to other people's questions, um, Him, Himanshu, um, I'll try to answer that if I can shortly, but but for now I'm going to kind of gloss over the last part of your question because it's a lot. It's a lot. It's gonna you know we, we've been on this for for 25 or so minutes. I want I want to try to get to other people to be yeah. fair. So so thank you for that part of the question. I, I promise I will try to answer it when when there's a little more time. Um, and actually the next question does seem to be about batteries anyway. So yeah, so but that, it sounds like it's a, it looks like it's, like it's an experimental one with the yeah, charge discharge here. So yeah. yeah, can you help me with cyclic charge discharge? Explain it and its experimental setup. Yeah, so some of that is going to be dependent on what, um, like what you're using, what uh, you know, are you using a potentiostat or a battery cycler, mm -hmm. um, or, or are you just setting up the battery? Uh, your, yourself, right? There, there's some there's some other questions uh, built in there, but I'll try to let me erase this first. Um, as far as um, charge discharge is concerned, you can accomplish it with through a variety of ways with a potential debt or a battery cycler. Very generally, though, it is chrono potentiometry that almost exclusively chronopotentiometry. Um, so, I mean, ex again, it, it's hard to really answer your question. What's the experimental setup? I mean, like if you have a battery cycler, it's like a big rectangular box. Whoops. Is there a bat? Yep. So, you know, if you have a battery cycler, if what you're talking about, what's the experimental setup? It's like, I have this big box and there's, lots of channels on it, right? This is like a battery cycler. It might be something like this. And there's however many channels. And if you have like a coin cell, you might have, this would be like the side profile of a coin cell. You might have a coin cell holder, which you'll you know slide this into the coin cell holder where it has some sort of metal contact on the bottom and there's some sort of spring on the top and it will have a connector on the back and this plugs in there. That could be one answer to your question, what's the experimental setup? I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking again without any more context. As far as experimental setup, if you're asking what is inside this battery, it looks like he's using a potentiostat, okay. not a battery cycler. He's okay. using a Gamry, okay. Gamry so framework. So maybe so it, I'm wondering if okay. it's the parameters of their software. Yeah. Question. Well, if it's a software specific question, yeah, I'm not going to be able to give you advice but exactly on how to use a uh, framework um, as uh, we're Pine, it, not Gamry, but so I can no. I can give you some advice. So the, the setup though, generally, so if you have a coin cell or you have a, a some kind of a cylindrical cell, sometimes there's tabs on both sides uh, whatever it is as long as you know if which one is the anode and which one's the cathode right um your and i don't know the colors for gamry so forgive me here too i um you know it would we have red green blue you know all the colors yeah, for our the leads are there's our difference i always i always forget exactly which is which yeah. um you're gonna want working electrode and working electrode sense to connect to the cathode and you are going to want counter electrode and reference electrode to connect to the anode. That is the physical setup that you will want. No need to use the counter sense line. You don't need it. Um, that is the setup. So you'll, you, you, uh, Gamry's, uh, as far as I can remember anyway, their, their cell cables don't stack nicely like pine researchers do um, <laughs> so as you know there's sometimes there's there's these banana cables right um where they it has it's a it's a banana plug and then in the back there's a there's a recess so you can plug 
another one into the back of it. And so you have, you have basically two stacked together, right? So this would be working and this would be working sense, or this would be, you know, counter and this would be reference and you can stack them. So for you, you might end up having to do like working with an alligator clip and counter, uh, sorry, reference and then counter kind of connected like alligator them all together somehow you'll have to you'll have to do some sort of kludgy thing like that if they don't stack but that's what you're going to do and so when you connect if your battery is made properly let's just say when you connect the working electrode to the cathode working sense and the uh reference and counter to the anode you should have a positive potential positive it's a voltage really you should have a positive voltage so if it's a lithium battery you might have like plus you know three point five volts or something like that, whatever. Okay. So that, that's the physical, um, setup that you should have when you, with just an electrode. Oh yeah. Sorry. So yeah. can I do cyclic charge discharge with three electrode system? If yes. And how, um, uh, it sounds like it's like just an electrode, not the entire just, cell. Yeah. So, so you're doing, you're doing electrode. like half, you're doing half cell tests. Um, yes. The tricky thing is you got to know what the, um what the potentials are so normally what you're doing with a cyclic charge discharge let me erase this and get to the that part of it with it with a charge discharge what you're normally doing is you have voltage here you have your lower limit you have your upper limit and you're going to add current until you hit the upper limit or you're going to take away current until you hit the lower limit now this volt this is volts like between anode and cathode so if you're using a reference electrode this is different so it's fine you just have to know what those voltages are and so when someone says for example with a lithium ion battery and i know you, i know you're just looking at one electrode and not the whole cell but typically we're looking at this is three volts versus lithium lithium plus so what is that in with relation to silver silver chloride if you're aqueous if it's not aqueous is it silver i don't know oxide yeah. nitrate like you have to know what these voltages are so the the reason why i can't answer easily is because the vast majority of the time um your reference electrode is just your uh, there is no reference electrode or if you have one maybe it's just a piece of lithium metal in which case these voltages are accurate and then you should be able to do it whether it behaves very well or not in a cell liquid setup is another thing because batteries typically need pressure that's why we use coin cells and and etc but if you're able to do that basically what you're doing is you're just setting current is equal to something x you know milliamps or microamps or whatever and then you have a, again i don't really I, I can't speak to gamry's software exactly so i don't know exactly how you do this but you want to trigger voltage is you know basically something like greater than or equal to whatever or voltage is less than or equal to whatever you're lower and so you're just applying a current at a set rate until the voltage hits one of these points and again what that voltage is may depend on what the reference electrode is mm -hmm. be careful of that because normally batteries are two electrode systems and so it's more straightforward with a reference electrode you got to know where the where that voltage is so 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 that could require some calculation but yeah that that's going to be the charge discharge process there's other variations on that there's more complicated ways to do it but that's as sort of briefly as i can mm -hmm. i guess give you now yeah about uh, how that process works yeah um hopefully that was helpful yeah hopefully um, that helps be if you have other questions feel free to type them in um you know in the interest of time and everything i am trying to be a little higher level you know give you a, an overview of some of these things but i can get more detailed as the case may need i suppose if you yeah. if you have other questions so so there is um sajid Shaf shafiq shafiq um I, I you may have you may have access to this one mm. um so uh sajid is asking that they're saying that they're you know, working with these working on a carbon paper 
But everyone, uh, you know, when they're doing cyclic voltammetry, they're getting some very awkward results, You're kind of wondering what, what's going on, what, what went wrong. Uh, while we don't have those results, so I can't actually tell you exactly what's going on, I can at least provide you with a few ideas about where you can run into problems with carbon paper. So carbon paper working electrodes are, are big, like they have a huge surface area. And if you're doing a cyclic voltammetry experiment on this huge surface area, you're, you're probably going to have a very big IR drop. And you're also going to have, you may even run into a lot of issues with uh, capacitance because mm -hmm. large surface area means you're going to have a very big capacitance on the working electrode. And that can cause issues in terms of noise, um, not getting very good analytical data, IR drop, a lot of things like that. And, and the carbon paper itself to the point of capacitance, carbon paper is porous. And so yeah. it has, you're working on a very non-specific and non-ideal surface. Yeah. You know, like a disc electrode or even like a sheet of metal yeah. is a plate, right? And it's relatively like well-defined surface area. Carbon paper, yeah. you're probably working on like a square and yeah. then there's pores and yeah. there's a lot of like, like heterogeneous surface that's probably increasing your capacitance, which as you said, is going to potentially cause some issues, IR yeah. drop and high capacitance and messy yeah. results. And yeah. then you think about what the diffusional patterns might be. Yeah. Because yeah. it's all over the place, right? It's, it's not like one direction. It's probably in the pores and yeah. you know, it could be kind of a mess. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're, if you're, most people use carbon papers for like a bulk electrolysis, like or fuel cells. Yeah. Or fuel cells. Just like I'm applying a huge potential mm. or uh, I'm just running it galvanostatically. I'm just like doing some electrosynthesis, making something. And I don't care what the CV looks like. I'm just trying to convert one thing to another thing. So if you're trying to get good analytical data, you might need to work on smaller electrodes but the chemistry should be indicative of when you move to larger electrodes. So hopefully um, that gives you some, some, uh, some sense of something to do. Um, and one thing that Neil and I have been kind of thinking about in, as an idea is uh, we can, um, we're, we're still learning a lot about Restream, but we do have the ability to perhaps bring a guest on mm. um, in Restream and you can actually share your data um, we haven't figured out the details of this yet, but if that's something that you're interested in, please let us know because, you know, hey, we could actually look at the data live and see what it is and talk through some of these problems. But yeah, that's something that we will uh, have have talked about doing for like our members on a YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, and that's still something we I think we'd like to do. It'd be cool. Yeah. Um, and and we, we yeah, we, we have to work out a little bit of yeah, the details, so I guess. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know, it's 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 not. We, we, there's a limit to how many people we can have on restream, right? Yeah, it's like six people total or something. Yeah, it's six total, but Us we included. could have people come on one at a time. That's true. Yeah, yeah, we and, didn't have them all at once. That way, then there's not like a million people once. talking. It's bad enough Alex and I are talking. Yeah, right? that's right. So <laughs> this bug is back. This bug is back. Can I clap it? Is that too loud? I'm sorry, everybody. I don't. I don't, I don't think it's. Too, I'm not really so that bad. sorry because I want it gone. Yeah, I'm, it's annoying I'm, me. I'm, it, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, this thing. It's all over me. Uh, is it? It's not. It doesn't even want you. It just wants to bug me. Just bug you. Oh, um, okay, sorry about that. So yeah. So um, yeah. Talk to us live, right? I mean, we we will. Um, I don't know when, and maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll give it a try. Like we we just haven't had the opportunity to sort of flesh out that um yeah what that process would yeah be exactly and, and stuff like but that. it will be most likely just so you all are aware a thing that we do exclusively for our youtube members yeah so yeah. we will probably post a link to join our restream in the community um of our youtube channel yeah that will be only visible to members so that that is so so we invite you and encourage you and thank you mm -hmm. if you are to join our YouTube channel as a yeah. member, you yeah. can get content like a full webinar, um, uh, you know, recordings and, and things from my previous webinars. And, uh, that will be another perk that we'll be happy to look into in the future. Yes. Um, uh, before moving to the next question, uh, Ferris Whitehouse, um, this is also uh, have kind of a follow up question mm. regarding the discussion about taffel plots. Um, and maybe I don't know if you can find it. He's asking, oh, is, there, there it is. is there any use 
of the TAFL plot without using an RDE, maybe using very small electrodes or something. Yeah. So micro electrodes yes. are one way around yeah. use, having to use RDEs. Ultra yeah. micro electrodes, UMEs, is a yeah. whole field where um, they are the small, small size of, ref, of, 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 a, of an electrode you can get like a like a fiber right like a little yeah. fiber of platinum yeah. um effectively eliminates diffusional effects or at least it control it, it acts to control the diffusion layer thickness because the electrode's so small that it that in that case that's a, that is one example where it allows you to isolate the kinetic information yeah and then the other part of that is that it's just there are situations and in, in systems where like in certain potential you know, ranges, it's roughly or approximately mostly kinetic information, right? Like there, there can be like, okay, well, if I'm looking at, I'm just an yeah. example, but if I'm looking at the beginning of a, a, like a CV and then like where the duck formation happens before I get a peak, like the very beginning of where that increase happens is pretty much all Butler Volmer, but like that's a narrow potential range. Mm -hmm. you know and yeah. it's still not totally accurate like you're still making an assumption that like that current is all faradaic yeah. kinetic information which it isn't there's obviously still some non faradaic stuff in there but like that would be some example of when you can kind of without an rde potentially make some inferences about like this is mostly kinetic so there's probably a decent chance that i can use tafel um you know, taffle plot and, and and with with some level of accuracy, mm -hmm. um, and 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 again, your point about the small electrodes is exactly right. UMEs are a uh, field of study where people do just that. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Shupam has a question. That was was that the next one? I think that's. I think. So. Yes, I think so. So Shupam Warat has a question. Whenever we plot dielectric loss for any dielectric material from EIS data, we obtain a peak max tangent loss at intermediate frequency range. Why it happens? So, a, first of all, there's there's a lot of subsequent questions that I would have that I'm obviously either you can try to answer in the uh, chat or if 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 you're not able to easily or you know this might be a question hard to answer for us without seeing what you mean. So, for example, when you say a peak, um. And EIS data, that is not, I don't know what you mean. For example, probably not Nyquist plot, but uh, in the Bode plot, if you mean a peak, I assume you mean with the phase angle. And then do you mean an upward peak or a downward peak? Um, you know, if the, if it, it, like in some cases, a peak, like an upward peak in the phase angle is an inductive thing, right? When the, when the, when the phase angle increases briefly, that sometimes can be an inductive in a body plot. Yeah, in a body plot. Yeah. In a body plot. Okay. So I don't know if that's an inductive thing. May not be. That might not be what you're talking about. Maybe it's just an inflection point in the um, body plot, uh, which could be a uh, between two processes with different capacitances. Um, but I don't know exactly what that is, and I don't know what exactly what max tangent loss means. So mm -hmm. some of this, I I simply don't know if I can answer. I, I don't know, um, and I don't know. What, what's also, the, what dielectric loss? Yeah, is. I don't know. I mean, that was what I was going to ask. Like, what is dielectric loss uh, yeah. of a material? I mean, you're. I, I mean, I assume you're talking about some capacitive material if you're talking about dielectric. So I assume you have largely capacitive behavior if you're talking about a dielectric. Like that's right. That's the thing in between yeah. a capacitor. And then I, I guess you're studying a material that is like losing its dielectric ability. So I'm just guessing here. I don't. I don't have a lot of experience with what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, and then again knowing what peak you're referring to and what tangent loss means. Um, but what I've just said is about as much as I could probably give you without knowing more information. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, again, so, some sort of different capacitive processes, uh, inflection points in the Bode plot, for example, that might make peaks or differences uh, usually are different processes or different capacitances that are um, different happening at different speeds. And so like two different capacitances separated by one or two orders of magnitude will intersect with some sort of inflection on the Bode plot. Um, but beyond that general comment, I don't know that I actually can answer much more thoroughly, unfortunately. The other thing is he, he says EIS data. Is he 
is it clear it's like he's talking about a Bodhi plot and not a Nyquist plot? Because you can have, like, you can, quote, have a peak. Like, you can have a peak within of a semicircle, right? Right, which would just mean a charge transfer process. Yeah, which would be a charge transfer process or something. Like, is because we don't know enough about the the uh, the dielectric loss or the dielectric materials that that um, yeah, Shimam right. is looking at. And maybe he's trying to figure out, like, why is there... Like, what does a peak in the semicircle refer to? But I, I don't know. I'm making things up. I don't know if he's looking at Bodhi <laughs> or Nyquist. So hopefully he can. I don't know if he. Yeah, can if you have any clarification, please feel free. Otherwise, I'm at a bit of a stop for what I, more I can try to help you. So anyway, I hope that was at least somewhat useful. But uh, but yeah, it's a bit uh, it's a bit light on what we can help further. Um, it looks like George is back. Of course we yeah. are going to George. Oh, George. You don't have a question. Well, then what are you here for? <laughs> so six months before, I asked you questions and you helped me a lot. In five days, I'll be done with my thesis. Well, oh, listen, nice. I don't want to be that guy, but I expect 20% of your salary. Because <laughs> you're about to get a job. I, I, I'll take a personal check or uh, Venmo is fine. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. After six months working on this electric chemistry on coatings project, I have one thing to say. Impedance is nuts. It absolutely it, is, it nuts. is. It is completely, it's completely nuts. nuts. It's very yeah. complicated and a lot of things happen during measurements. They sure do. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm glad we could be helpful. Congratulations, George. Yes. Good yeah. for you. Good for you. I hope you have a very long and successful career and you send some of your salary my way. Okay. We have a <laughs> Rahul Patel uh, asked a question here. Mm -hmm. um hi in four pro in four probe eis of a membrane we don't get a warburg or cpe can you please explain the reason um and i think what he's talking about is like he has the working he has working drive working sense counter uh counter and then reference on four points of a membrane so something yeah whatever. usually what you do is you put the you put the sense lines closest together and the drive lines are outside of that. Sure. Okay. Because yeah. the potential stack can make up whatever it needs to to drive right, the to extra drive. distance, but you're trying to sense it across a finite distance. Yeah. Usually that's what a four point probe you're doing is. And you don't get a Warburg or a CPE. It, well, well, okay. First of all, is this in solution? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, do you have liquid? Uh, you should have a solution there. You could have likely. a you could have a membrane in principle and just put those probes and try to do EIS. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, if it's soaked, maybe. I don't know what you would get though. And if you're not yeah. getting, I mean, if you don't have a Warburg, I can understand. But you don't have a CPE. What do you have? There's, yeah. Do you yeah. just have a point, or do you yeah, have that's nothing? Right. Like, I guess I'm confused as to what you have at all if you don't have either of those things. Yeah. It's a bit puzzling to me um it's hard to avoid capacitive processes period yeah the Any, only way yeah. is if you have solid state kind of a thing you don't have like yeah. if you have liquid you probably have um capacity i mean you must have yeah. some capacitance in some way and but but the thing to me is that my other question would be why are you um uh, what what are you what are you doing what is the purpose of your experiment and, and i don't mean that um uh, I mean that literally. So are you trying yeah. to measure the, uh, uh, what is it, the conductivity of your membrane or something, right? Like, or you know, those are some of the reasons why people do four-point probe. And basically the measurement of the conductivity of a membrane comes from a resistance measurement and impedance is a way to get resistance. So, so mm -hmm. essentially, you, even from that perspective, I would say that possibly if you're able to get a resistance from the impedance data, um, it doesn't really matter if you have a lot of capacity. Like, and now how accurate is that resistance? I don't, you know, these are all open questions in general. But roughly speaking, it's soaked, it scatters at the end point. Okay. Um, yeah, it might just be protonic, right? like nothing. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think uh, okay. I think that you are in a situation where um, you have a lot of odd things happening so for what like if you just have like flat membrane on a desk it's soaked in sulfuric acid if it's nafion for mm -hmm. example and you just take your probes and you just touch the membrane in four places you have a couple of things first of all it's like when you clip to an electrode in a three electrode experiment you have a you have a beaker 
and you have your electrode sitting in. You don't put the alligator clip in the liquid. Yeah. Right? You have the electrode in the liquid and the alligator clip is above. Well, what you're talking about is actually you're like touching the membrane. You're... Now, maybe you have a alligator clip to a, I don't know, piece of platinum and the platinum touches the membrane. But like yeah. what it sounds like you're doing is you're touching the electrode leads directly into the into, wet into membrane. Yeah. 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 So solution. it's almost you have some weird thing going on where you might actually yeah. be adding the leads of the potentiostat cell cable yeah. into your experiment, which you don't want to do. Yeah. Right. Now that may not be the case, but that's what it sounds like. Um, and then the second thing is that you have this, you can do electrochemistry with very little solution. Um, but it does call into question exactly what's going on. So a lot of membrane tests that people do are a little more, um, sophisticated than sort of just having it like there, there's cells with like, you know, capillaries that are just dist set distance apart. And like, there's, there's, there's different, um, setups. And sometimes you put a membrane in between and squished in between two, you know, O-rings there, there's, so there's, there's things that are done in that fashion. Um, and so it's all liquid phase. Cause I guess the tricky thing is that even if, aside from what I just said that you know, your leads might be actually touching the solution, which would probably make it noisy just because, um, y y how much continuity is there in the membrane with it just being mm. soaked yeah. in solution? What if the water is evaporating while you're testing? It's in the open. Like, is the system stable? Is it stable? Right. right. There's a lot stable of like open there. questions here that probably account for why you have this and scattering points and it's tricky. And then ultimately, though, what I would say is that, as I said before, okay, you're getting some scatter. Let's say maybe it's just that you said the end point. So maybe, I don't know if it's at the high frequency or the low frequency, but let's say one end of it is sort of messy or noisy. If you can still get a measure of the resistance, you might still be able to get a measure of the conductivity because the conductivity, and I always mess this up. It's like, it's like, it's um, an inverse relationship. Yeah. Kind of thing. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, like if you have an area and it, it's like a over it's it's um it's r, r a over r times d or something like that is sigma or, or, or it's or it's oh, really? or d over right. r a something like that because you get you get like siemens per centimeter is usually the the unit for connectivity or right. or siemens centimeters i always forget it's like it's like one over ohm centimeter something like that mm -hmm. anyway the air the surface area of interest and the diameter like the thickness of the membrane and a resistance and apologies for being not as specific. Basically, those are the typically the three things you need. If you can get a resistance somehow from this impedance experiment, even if it's noisy, if you can get an if you can get a resistance value with some level of certainty, you might be able to still calculate that, uh, like your your conductivity of your membrane. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would be my my follow up point, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. That was which question? Um, I that was what was and that that was before George. Yeah, that was checked. oh four point probe. I see it. There it is. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the next one, um, Malukin, do I need a conductor substrate for electrode deposition of a catalyst on? GDL. I never remember. Gas what. diffusion layer. Gas diffusion layer. Um, I think you, I don't know, for all electrochemistry experiments, I feel like things need to be conductive, like the, the well, substrate that's being deposited on. Conductor substrate for electrode deposition? Yeah, for sure. Um, especially if it's electrode deposition. Yeah. Because electrode deposition is where you are using electrochemistry to reduce, usually you know, yeah. create a layer of something onto something else. Well, that thing you're coding onto has got to be conductive. Otherwise it can't carry a charge to yeah. electro deposit. Yeah. Um, and for a gas diffusion layer for like in a fuel cell, usually it's done with carbon paper or carbon felt or carbon cloth, yeah. something like that, which is conductive. So yeah. yeah, most certainly you do. Or if you need to use something non-conductive like glass, for example, just, you know, for whatever you're testing, Usually they code it with FTO or ITO, which is conductive. Yeah. So it basically is a conductive layer, even if the yeah. substrate itself at the its core isn't, right? Mm -hmm. There has to be something conductive for that to work. So yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. You're gonna, to you're, you're gonna need something conductive. 
that's helpful. Um, next one. Tsaritsa. Tsaritsa. Uh, Tsaritsa. Thank you. Can you guys please suggest best three electrode system for non, I guess that's supposed to be aqueous yeah. media? Um, well, I, I would say uh, I, I've worked with You a have more of, with this than I do. You it, certainly know more. Yeah, I mean, we just did some stuff. So ferrocene is a really good redox molecule that is soluble in acetonitrile, nitrile. And then there is a, um, there's a salt you can use. Uh, let me see if I can't. It's a TBAPF6. It's tetrabutyl ammonium hexafluorophosphate. Yeah, so, hexafluorophosphate. Yeah, there we go. It's a mouthful. It is a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. T let me, let me TBAPF6. F6. And let me see if I can at least find like just, um, yeah, this is just a link to like Fisher Scientific for the product. But this is a good salt that is soluble. It's like a supporting electrolyte. As a supporting electrolyte. So I'm just, oh, uh, I can't. Oh, wait. Okay. I was wanting to type this into the chat. Um, hold on. It's just, I'm good. I was going to send, the, I was going to put a link in the chat, but it's just better to type the name in. Mm. But that's the supporting electrolyte, tetrabutyl ammonium hexafluorophosphate as the supporting electrolyte. Um, and then you can use things like a glassy carbon electrode, platinum wire. Um, you could even get away with a silver silver chloride reference electrode for acetyl nitrile but um some people use a silver wire qre quasi uh, reference electrode sometimes ferrocene itself is the internal standard because uh, i don't know why most non-aqueous systems don't have a quote standard redox potential system um that it's, everything's referenced to, right? Like everything in aqueous systems is referenced to the uh, hydrogen, standard hydrogen electrode. But non-aqueous systems, you'll have all these different solvents, all these different potentials, so they, they never have a consistency. But that is one of the easiest and best to use, easy to work with non-aqueous electrochemical systems. Um, but the moment, but you can do stuff in, um, methylene chloride and DMSO and tetrahydrofurane, you may need to use um, different supporting electrolytes that will make it conductive. And you will probably have to use some level of IR compensation because all of these non-aqueous electrolytes are still pretty resistive. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, if you need further clarification, uh, let me know. And that's just my opinion about the best three electrode system for yeah. non-aqueous media. Yeah. Seed and seed and night trial. Yeah. All these other ones, some of them are like also just a obligatory word of safety. These are all, a lot of these are pretty aggressive, yeah. aggressive stuff like THF and DMSO. They're yeah. kind of, uh, they can be kind of nasty. So yes, they can be safe. A seed and night trial is relatively harmless. Relatively. I mean, I mean, I, I wouldn't say drink it. Yeah, but, don't drink it. But uh, yeah. You shouldn't even drink deuterated water. That's what yeah, I uh, guess. That's, is that bad? I, I mean, I, I, I remember speaking to somebody about this. So deuterated water is just like, it's water. It's chemically water. But instead of hydrogen, you have deuterium. deuterium. Right? And but isn't, isn't that used as like a, uh, like a tracking thing, right? Yeah. So Cause... it's, it's like a, it's what we refer to as an isotopologue and it oh, can, um, are you familiar with this? No, but I know I, I know something about how, yeah, you can like if fluorescence or something, it'll show up, right? Or yeah, so um, it can show up in a variety of different types of like techniques. I'm more familiar with it from, say, spectroscopy. So, for example, if you had um, if you have a molecule and it's got some hydrogens on it, you can usually do some level of water exchange where you have this deuterated water. Mm. And instead of having hydrogens for, for some of the bonds, you have deuterium atoms. And what that does is because it's heavier, it's like a harmonic oscillator, mm. it now vibrates at, at a different frequency. So that's a way it's like, okay, do I have this species or another species? It's like, oh, well, this peak shifted a little bit. Just just enough of, you know, so chemically it's doing all the same stuff. I bet it shows up in like IR, um, uh, like uh, FTI, FTI, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. It shows up in that's, the FTIR. That's where the, that's where the, vibration the vibrational goes. energy, so you'll yeah. see a different um, 
yeah, you'll wave see a number, different, uh, for, wave number for it for that. Yeah, that's cool. It's definitely useful for like, um, uh, so isotopologs, I, I highly encourage everyone who's doing like CO2 reduction. You should do at least one experiment to double check, use carbon 13 CO2 to make sure you're reducing CO2 to whatever you think you're reducing oh, yeah. it to, because there's only like, I don't know, 1% of, of carbon 13 in, uh, just in carbon generally. So if all of a sudden you create this new molecule, cause you've converted CO2 to methanol, you better have a lot of, of C13 methanol in your system, but this is cause if you have C12, you're probably just converting some carbonaceous junk into your, in your system. And it's not CO2. <laughs> yeah. yeah. My only experience with that is NMR because you, yeah. you, you either have H or carbon NMR, right? Those are the two options. I think I did. There's like another one. C13 very NMR, rare, but, but it, uses, yeah. it uses one of those isotopes. Or something. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And right. I think I did. And, and yeah. Then, All it does is it makes the numbers bigger. Yeah, yeah. Right oh, for the NMR, is hey, the, a, the H the numbers are smaller, and then C they're bigger. Yeah, the NMR. It's been forever. I did NMR so long ago, and it wasn't a bench top NMR. It was a giant honking thing with oh, liquid argon, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And it was yeah. you had to you had to you had to center center this weird thing yeah. on the computer for a bit, and then yeah. shimmy. Yeah, shim. Yeah, that's shimmy. that. That's it. Oh, All man. right, and you had to like. Rotate around like you were a disc jockey. Yes. Yeah, oh so man, like NMR was. Fun. I actually thought it was fun, but it was like not science. It's yeah. just like <laughs> it was just like you know you learn how to do it. It's like well you gotta twist and shimmy this thing until this little plus sign is near that circle and then yeah. you're good. You know, it's like this is science. This what? Is science. <laughs> yeah. Is this okay? Great. And I put a tiny little test tube at the top of a gigantic cylinder. Yes. Know? Yeah. It's wild. It's like all the all the stuff. And it's it's like the most you it's the most used for in or for organic chemists. Yeah, yeah, because you can see what specific species you have. Yeah. Just based on like the, the peak splitting. I'm, I, those puzzles are cool, but I, I yeah. don't want to like interpret those. <laughs> Looks like we got a question from Ramachandra. What are the possible supportive electrodes that can be used? for aqueous systems well you want your electrodes to be supportive that's for sure yeah you know you don't want those ones that are criticizing you electrodes that are you know they should be supportive, supportive. they should be really like in a healthy way in a healthy yeah like a give and take yeah it's you know? a little bit of give and take you know they're going to be open and honest with you yeah they, they can't be, if they're hiding things from you <laughs> <laughs> those are not your real those electrodes. are not your real friends right the electrodes that lie Electrodes that lie, you know, you got to get rid of them. You got to, you got to move on. Yeah. You got to take some time for you. And, and there, are, there's plenty of electrodes out there. You'll find them. Yeah, You'll there's find plenty of electrodes, electrodes in the sea. It takes a while to find the supportive electrodes. This is the corniest thing. <laughs> sorry, sorry, how much I just this is like. This is I tough. hope, I hope this humor is uh, widely explored in the in the world. Yes. Like everybody kind of yeah, deals with this. Yeah, this we're trying to be supportive. We're trying to be nice. Yeah. We're very much just bad, bad jokes. Bad yeah, jokes. yeah, yeah. So I think what you mean is supporting electrolyte. No, I, well, I don't. Or, actually... or, or is it supportive electrodes? Or, su I, or I think su he means electrodes. He means I mean, electrodes. I well, yeah, yeah. I, so yeah, if, if you mean electrolyte, I mean it, the answers are ubiquitous. You know, acid base, or chlorides, or, yes. or salts, yeah, right? I think he means salt. electrodes. So what are the possible electrodes like that work? Yeah, okay. For aqueous, I mean that's also Cl clarify. You know, yeah. Uh, if if, if I mean, you I'm, want a, a salt, different salts, or if you want the electrode materials. Electrode materials. Yeah. If it's electrode materials, you mean? I mean, there's supportive electrolytes. Oh, okay. So oh, okay. Electrolytes. Electrolytes. okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, gosh, there's so. I mean, there's honestly, there's so many options, right? For, yeah. It depends whether you're looking at acid or base. So for acids, yeah. it's, you know, people. The most common one, of course, is um, is is sulfuric acid. H2SO4, you know, anywhere from, I don't know, 0.01 molar to one molar to five yeah. molar. Dep depends what you're looking at. And then people use nitric acid and hydrochloric yeah. acid. And uh, honestly, yeah. th this is one of these things. It's like electrochemistry requires electrolyte, right, for, an, for a system. And that just means there has to be some anion and some cation in solution so like yeah. quite literally almost anything that dissolves in water yeah right will work mm -hmm. and then why you choose one thing over another the the answers are very they're various yeah they're all various. over right i mean yeah but and as long as there are positively charged things and negatively charged things in the solution that water will dissolve yeah it will work 
Yeah. You know, with some amount of, of concentration. Yeah. And um, some people, their selection of electrolyte um, in, say, a neutral thing has to do with, well, does the ion negatively interact with your electrode? So yeah. some people claim like chloride, for example, will... Um, like chloride could can stick to like a gold electrode or yeah, something or like that too. or platinum. Yeah. And uh, so they don't want an electrolyte that's chloride. So they might use sodium nitrate. And sodium nitrate's a, a good electrolyte in that kind of situation. So those are those are the things. But but Neil's completely right. Like if it dissolves, so you don't want to use, oddly enough, silver chloride. Silver chloride doesn't it doesn't really dissolve in right. in water, but like uh, you know, potassium chloride does and sodium chloride and stuff like that yeah so that uh that's hope hopefully that's um that is that answers your uh question about supportive electrolytes and and uh, the electrolytes should also be supportive as well you know yeah, i mean uh, the, electrodes the electrodes and the electrolytes, electrolytes they should be all working in harmony yeah you know yeah everybody should be building each other up saying words of encouragement and they should you know together you should have a really nice potential window right yeah. and if if one of them's keeping you down your potential window is going to be it's going to be down and you don't want that you're going to want very big <laughs> <laughs> as big a potential window as possible you, you really can't set us up with these dad joke kinds of things i know, you know, I know. Of, <laughs> this yeah. is the running game uh robert Chaja is also asking will these acidic or basic electrolytes react with the moiety that is already existing in test solutions yeah they could so that's Absolutely. another thing you have to be aware of that to be to be serious so like it, like just as an example if you have um silver ions or silver something in solution and you have a chloride electrolyte silver chloride will precipitate out and so yeah. it could react like right so you have to be aware of all of the combinations you have like if you put NaCl and KCl and K2SO4 in solution together, mm -hmm. right? All combinations of those anions and cations are soluble and will not precipitate. Like NaCl, mm -hmm. NaSO, Na2SO4, KCl, and K2SO4, and if I didn't even add any other ones, whatever. Yeah. Like all of those are dissolvable salts, right? So yeah. like all the uh, permutation of plus with minus is not something with a very low KSP, for example, right? where it will basically not dissolve such that when those two moieties are present, they will you know, suck up together, become a solid and precipitate out, yeah. which is something you wouldn't want because it could mess up your electrochemistry, could yeah. change the concentration, et cetera, right? So yes, you have to be aware of that. There are, of course, many um combinations that are not not very soluble so it, it it is something you want to be aware of when you're you know choosing okay well i'm going to choose this acid or this base yeah um what else do i have in solution for whatever reason that i'm testing are there any combinations of those that are not soluble in water or less soluble right you yeah. you do want to to be aware of that for sure um if you can yeah um that that is a, that is a good like way to be thinking i suppose you could say yeah another thing to uh to consider is that um, this is mostly for like some inorganic chemists sometimes an inorganic chemist may have some molecule that uh can form hydrides on on the molecule and so in some cases you may have like an acid in your in your system but if you use a slightly stronger acid all of a sudden you're your test solution, the redox molecule of interest, it'll actually be more prone to form a hydride with with the acid than it used to. So the so the pKa all of a sudden, you know, both like basically two acids, but one's a little stronger, changes your your electrochemistry. So stuff definitely stuff to keep in in mind. Um, so he says he's using perfluoro PFOA, which is perfluorooctanoic acid. Okay. Um, I don't know enough. So you're trying to create, that. yeah. So basically, it's 50 parts per 50 ppm or something. That also sounds like very little, but I'm. I yeah, well, that's like... it's probably why you're trying to increase the connectivity, obviously. Yeah. And you want to add it to something that's not going to 
um, oh. cause any precipitation or issues, right? Yeah. So I'm just, I mean, I don't know a lot about PFOA personally, but I'm looking at it and it's basically, it says it's soluble in polar organics. So I'm guessing if you used, let's see, the, 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 it, it, it's a long hydrocarbon chain with fluorine. And then oh. it has it has a carboxylic at the end, basically it's COOH. Okay. So that's so it's how it's, that it's mildly. It's probably not very acidic because the CO the the last H is going to pop off a little, and it probably has. I, I'm, I'm yeah. trying, I don't know where it's pKa is it. But okay, but like yeah, it's so. probably soluble in organic solvents, just based on you said it's a long polar molecule. Polar organic solvents. It is soluble in water though, so I'm so you have parts per million, so I'm assuming you're okay. doing it in water. Yeah. So it's an it's an inaqueous system. And, uh, um, but that's the, that's the thing he's looking at. That's the, like Ramachandra is trying to study that's that system. Right, 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 right. Um, it, honestly, you know, depending on what the other electrodes are, I'm just going to throw out there, um, made out of nano pure water. I might just try some things. Like, I think if you just like, can you just try potassium chloride? Well, like what's or, that going to do? Well, it depends either if you want to do acid, like it's an acid. Yeah. Um, nano pure water. I mean, you might just add, well, it's, it depends Like if you're trying to keep chloride out, right. You might want to use like sulfuric acid or like sodium sulfate or something like that. Yeah. Probably won't do very much to it. Um, the danger is that it would form like sodium perfluoroorganate. Or or, or, yeah. or whatever the name I said the name wrong, but you know what I mean. Like it's perf it's the acid the A and the PFOA is because it has the COOH. So if the H pops off, mm -hmm. if another if sodium PFO or whatever if that's what it's yeah. called is you know or potassium or something uh, is 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 not soluble, you don't want to use Na or K or something, right? Yeah. I, I, I don't you, that you might have to look that up. I don't yeah. know offhand. Um, so in that case, I think if you did an acid, if you mixed it with something, because then the cation of an acid is also H plus, so it's not going to yeah. create any. It probably wouldn't create any issues. So I would suggest something like H two SO four or HNO three, sulfuric or nitric acid. Yeah. If you need to increase the conductivity, it's going to be acidic. Obviously, your pH is going to be very very low. If you can tolerate acidic solution, that brings up other questions. Does PFOA have any um, negative impacts from being in a strongly acidic solution? I have yeah. no idea. Maybe not. It is a mild acid itself because yeah. it has a, uh, you know, that way. Um, KF be an option. Again, the problem is if K PFO or, you know, or whatever, as I said, um, which means K plus, K and, plus and, and F minus. Right. If those things, and F minus. Uh, something to a floor if that well if if the if the k yeah right if if the, if 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 the part other than the h from the carboxylic acid is going to grab onto some cation and form a solid then you wouldn't want to use um you know an alkaline or alkaline earth metal cation because mm -hmm. I, I again i don't know if it would and then straight hf maybe but hf scares the crap straight out of me HF. <laughs> so, um if you're using straight hf you have other concerns like make sure you're using yeah. High density polyethylene or something. HF is pretty nasty. It doesn't. It doesn't work in glass. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and maybe and and your I, I, your suggestion, Chris, is probably a good one from the perspective that this has fluorine in it, and you're thinking about those lines. But from what I can tell from the structure of PFOA, is it seems unlikely to me the fluorine is going to do very much. It's 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 basically like a bunch of like it's like methane or eth ethane. Like it's it's a it's a fully was a fully fully saturated on whatever Fluorinated. Yeah, yeah like it's like s a carbon with four fluorines around it or three fluorines and then another carbon like this is a very stable um molecularly and so it's not easy to pop a fluorine off such yeah. that it isn't likely you're going to get unless you did something to it or i guess and maybe i'm wrong and that may be the case but it doesn't this is a st it's a stable form of a fluorocarbon that probably isn't going to um, have fluorine readily coming off and doing anything. That'd be my guess. Yeah. So I don't know that it's necessary to sort of add a fluorine, a fluorinated electrolyte from that perspective. I'd be more concerned about the cation possibly, again, 
precipitating with the perfluoral octanoate. Yeah. Right. So that 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 that's that would be my concern, I guess. Yeah. Um, but you know, this, this yeah. might take some some trial and error too on your yeah. part. You might have to sort of add some PFOA stuff or whatever. Um, since PFOA is highly persistent, do you doubt it will react to supporting electrolyte? Not necessarily. I, assuming by highly persistent, it's a, it's a PFAS and it's one of those forever chemicals. Yeah. I don't know that that means it doesn't support, doesn't react with supporting electrolyte. That'd be an interesting discovery. <laughs> well, it, you know, you, when you say it doesn't react with supporting electrolyte, just because it's highly persistent, it's like, and, and, and I'm and I may be off here, but based on my understanding of this sort of field of study, is you're studying the chemicals that get into water systems that are in very small um, mm -hmm. concentrations, but are, we have you know concerns because they they don't go away very easily, and we're trying to figure out ways to mitigate that or get rid mm -hmm. of them or something, right? And you're talking about if it reacted with supporting electrolyte, well, it wouldn't be a forever chemical because it would probably react. But you're assuming that there's a lot of sulfuric acid concentration in the water supply, which is also probably not true. So, you know, what what you're you're talking about two different things. You're talking about it's a forever chemical, so that means it probably doesn't react with very much because it sticks around. It doesn't like mm -hmm. you know react with anything. That's probably true. But like the kinds of chemicals that you're talking about using in the laboratory are not chemicals that also are in the water supply. There's not a lot of nitric and sulfuric acid in the water supply. Yeah, so one thing doesn't necessarily have to do with the other. Or or even like you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it is the case that it doesn't react with sodium because there is a lot of sodium in the general, yeah. you know, water supply or yeah. whatever salt and stuff. So maybe that's the case. That may be the case. Um, but I do think that there's some trial and error here you're going to have to do to see and 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 check some you know dissociation constants and make sure something's not precipitating and, and et cetera, right? You might yeah. have to artificially increase the amount of PFOA to make sure it's not precipitating, you know, stuff like that. So it's like, yeah. if it isn't precipitating at 10,000 parts per million, well, it's probably not pre pre precipitating at 50 parts. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. create a higher concentration solution to sort of test proof of concept for some of this yeah. stuff and, and do stuff like that. Yeah. Just, just getting a couple like scintillation vials out and just, just like, popping a couple of these things in and adding different electrolytes and seeing whether or not it goes from clear to cloudy. Yeah. Right. Right. You're looking for color changes and things yeah. like that or, or whatever changes. Chris says photochemical reactions are more likely to degrade it. If you remember correctly. Yeah. That may be the case probably. Yeah. Um, and that's one of those things that, uh, you know, uh, we're yes. trying to find electrochemical solutions to something that we, might have like a solar solution, but yeah. water supplies are not exposed to sunlight. So that's, you know, that much, yeah. you're checking its conductivity in a three electrode system. Yeah. So, um, which is a good system to just, use. Yeah, of course. But uh, of course, your problem is that uh, just 50 parts per molar, uh, excuse me, parts per million of something is not much <laughs> conductivity at all. So, yeah, having a yeah. supporting electrolyte is definitely going to be going to be needed there. Yeah. Yeah. There was, Half a question I ignored earlier, was there which was about the electrochemistry of batteries. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> so I think I can try to talk about that quickly here. If there if there, if there aren't any other, other until there, until until or unless there are other questions that pop up, yeah, I'll try to answer. And I and I'm not sure if you're still around, uh, Imanshu from before. Perhaps you'll watch this later if you didn't stick around, but there was a, just a question basically about the electrochemistry of batteries, which is again, a very general question, but I'll, I'll try to just, maybe I can give a quick overview of how a battery works. And I'll talk about a lithium ion battery because that's what I know best. But um, in a battery, again, lithium ion, you'll have two electrodes, you'll have an anode, And you'll have a cathode. Okay. And they're separated by a membrane. So this is my membrane. Okay. Um, what we have here is that when the battery is 
100% charged and fully, fully, fully charged. Basically, the anode is full of lithium. The cathode has none. So the form of this lithium is could be anything, okay? So I have it stacked in here somehow, intercalated in here somehow, whatever it is, okay? So I have lithium that's basically in the anode stored, ready to go. The discharging of my battery, discharging is when I take the lithium from my anode and I pass it to the cathode. And so eventually over time, I build up the lithium on my cathode and it goes away from the anode. Now those processes are varying. There's different methods through which lithium is intercalated, stored, reacted on either side. But this is the general process. And then the charging, when I go back the other way, is when I put the lithium back, okay? I'm skipping like a million different theoretical steps here, but very generally and very briefly, again, just on a very high level kind of an answer for what is the electrochemistry of batteries, it's like a ping pong match of lithium ions between two electrodes. That's ultimately what's happening is lithium is going back and forth between anode and cathode. And when it's going from the anode to the cathode, it's discharging. When it's going from the cathode to the anode, it's charging. And I just completely trivialized the entire lithium ion battery in about two minutes. <laughs> there you go. So that is that And is, that's how a battery works, yes, folks. <laughs> that is that is very, very like basic uh uh butchered electrochemistry of how a, ba a lithium ion battery works. And so if it's sodium, then it's sodium moving back and forth. If it's another kind of battery, it's a mm -hmm. different kind of ion moving back and forth. But that is very briefly how the how it works. Uh, we just got a new question from uh, Sukanta. And what is the peroxide oxidation potential versus uh, RHE for water? It's a good question. I don't know. It's probably some plus, some over one. Like if you have is a platinum one? electrode, for example, um, probably like 1.2, 1. 1.4, 1. something. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's at least what we use for rotating. Peroxide this. oxidation potential versus RHG. The peroxide oxidation potential. So it, it, there's a lot of, there's different reactions here. I'm trying to see. H2O2. Oh. Like so, oh, because it can it can do it could do a couple. It could do things. It different things, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like for example, I'm just looking at a some 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 pages here with H2O2 going to oxygen with protons and electrons happens at an E not standard of minus 0.682 volts versus RG. Yeah. So that's just one possibility. Yeah. Uh, standard potentials. Let's see. Uh, I can I can look That's them up. I mean, these are things you can look up, but again, it depends on what reaction is specifically yeah. is supposed to be happening here. Um, eight. Let's see if I can. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking about if you're doing like a rotating ring disc electrode experiment, and you have a platinum yeah. ring. If you apply a very positive, like over one volt, like one, I, I've I think I've held, had it held at like 1.2, 1.3 versus silver silver chloride. And that's enough to oxidize peroxide back to hydrogen, back, back to, to uh, back to oxygen, back to oxygen. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Plus, uh, plus, plus point, plus one. Goes, yeah. And there's water. This is an, an, and maybe one reason why this is a little complicated is because there's no, like, it depends on the pH of the system, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. If yeah. the pH, so, the bug is back. Yeah. If the pH is, <laughs> the pH and the bug is back. It is. If the pH is low, the potential goes higher. So, like, an acid, it's yeah. one, you know. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So this is here. I'll share this page because, mm -hmm. yeah, I found I've, I'm just I'll put the. Uh, Maybe the link. In the... Well, it's just the Wikipedia page on standard reduction. I, mean, I can share the link for sure, but mm -hmm. I'll just show it here. Here's uh, this one, for example. This is the one that I just read. I had it. I had it. I had it the opposite way, which is negative. So mm -hmm. right here you have O2. Um, plus two protons plus two electrons. So this is an acid goes to H2O2. Uh, it's point, about 0.7. And this is assumed to pH seven. 
I think, because it's like E naught, so it's a standard conditions. So yeah. you go down seven points, it's about four hundred millivolts. So that's about one, one point two, one point three. Yeah. So so that yeah. that that tracks, right? If you're in sulfuric acid, mm -hmm. it's going to be three hundred, two hundred, yeah. whatever millivolts. pH goes down, standard goes up. So we're at about yeah. one versus RHE ish. Yeah. You know, and ish. then. And if it's versus silver chloride, take away 200, yeah. and then you have a significant overpotential. So yeah. you're doing one, and you have a high enough driving force. Yeah. So that when peroxide shows up, it's immediately oxidized or yeah. well reduced, I guess. Yeah. Uh, no, oxidized. Uh, oxidized. Yeah, 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 oxidized. Yeah, oxidized. yeah other way. Other yeah. way yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're pushing it towards the uh, oxygen side. So yeah, so so the 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 short answer is 0.7 basically versus RHE. Um, the longer answer is like. If you're an acid, it's like one ish, right? And then it's what potential you're going to want to be at to make that happen, right? So, like Alex said, one, mm -hmm. 1.2, 1.3. It's usually what you yeah. bias a uh, ring at to make sure you're getting that peroxide detected. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Different I'm research. I'm not sure if there's a question or just a comment. Yeah, I think it's just a comment. Different research on cathode anode chemistries govern energy storage and power transfer which make lithium ion batteries the best candidate for future batteries oh well part of it is that lithium is thermody what is it i mean thermodynamically it's it's element number three the the um it, it's i can't think of the right words to say what i it has the highest potential energy of any element for this purpose just by itself um because as you go down the periodic table right you have lithium and then sodium and then cesium mm -hmm. i skipped one rubidium cesium rubidium rubidium cesium francium right oh on the on the, the alkaline, the metals. alkaline yeah yeah I, I did it right i'm a chemist i should know the periodic table it's lithium Lithium's sodium potassium but no but potassium is but no pota yeah potassium, potassium. Then, then it's rubidium, rubidium cesium, cesium francium. francium. Yeah. See, I missed what the heck. I missed. I missed that. Cesiums and cesium is actually one of the largest elements because when you get to that, that yeah, area it's, of the periodic table, you have relativistic effects. Right. It's it's huge. It's weird. And, and and in theory, if you put a chunk of pure cesium in water, it would just explode. Yeah. Because well, if you, you put a chunk of all these, I know. But like lithium kind of fizzes. I've done it. I've yeah. done it a lot actually. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> lithium kind of fizzes and, and will spark if it under certain conditions sodium is pretty fun it's pretty aggressive mm -hmm. potassium is really dangerous you gotta be careful yeah yeah it'll go like and then up. i've never i've seen a video of rubidium i think once and it's like it's huge oh wow like pure rubidium metal you put it in water and it's just like whoosh, it's crazy it's super fun yeah. so anyway the point of that is i don't know that actually makes it sound opposite um that's just because of the that's an energy thing that's a that's, that's an electron reaction with, water. reaction with water yeah yeah um the point is that it's it's a it's it's a potential thing. So, yeah. the the potential of lithium. Um, I know I can't I can't ex I feel like I can't explain this. Or I I could when I was in graduate school when I was studying them I knew the the right terminology to say what I'm trying to say better than what I'm saying now. It, it's but, like the redox reaction associated with lithium has a higher potential. Yeah, and that's the thing that governs the voltage of a battery. Right, which is what governs basically the power. Yeah. Not necessarily energy storage because that yeah. is how much current and how much whatever that yeah. is more related to what you said about the research on the anode and the cathode chemistries. So that gets us to John Goodenough, who just passed away, rest in peace, yeah. professor at the University of Texas. He was one of the most important people. He won a Nobel Prize last year or something. Yeah. Uh, he basically so. discovered the cathode materials for lithium ion batteries. And so that kind of research on cathode, in, <laughs> in his case, cathode, um, chemistries revolutionized lithium ion batteries because it provided a way outside of using pure lithium metal, which in theory should work the best, but it suffers from a lot of problems, dendrites and a, a lot of other things. You know, in theory, you should just be able to use lithium metal. It would work great. And it, it does in theory, but in practice, it doesn't. So uh, John Goodenough basically discovered lithium cobalt oxide, lithium iron phosphate, and these materials used as cathodes to safely store lithium on the cathode side. Mm -hmm. And then it was, it's a Japanese uh, researcher. I think it's Yoshida or something. I, I forget. I don't remember exactly. He was one who discovered graphite works better than pure lithium metal for the anode. So the modern lithium ion battery that we use has no pure lithium in it. Mm -hmm. 
um, because the earliest batteries they used pure lithium metal and they um, were not safe. Yeah. So, um, so all of that is what makes lithium the best candidate for future batteries. And what I mean, not just future; it's current batteries. Basically, every yeah. every electric. I I think I'm not 100 percent sure, but most or all electric cars, phones, you know, laptop batteries, mm -hmm. everything it runs on lithium ion technology. It's, it's the best. It works yeah. the best. Um, and it still has a ways to go. That's why that's the, I think the future and the hottest research topic in electrochemistry, yeah. you know, um, batteries are still the biggest source of power and problem for electronics because elect, uh, like, technology increases faster than battery technology does. So we continually get more and more technological advances in all areas of like human existence, right? We just, we're mm -hmm. technologically discovering and advancing and improving it all, all over. And we need to power those devices and things. Yeah. And the batteries still the, like the 80, bottleneck. 90%. Yeah, it's the bottleneck. And, and it's like 80, 90% of the weight is in the battery, you know, of yeah. a car, of your phone. Like your phone would weigh nothing. You, you know how much a, a, a like a PCB chip weighs? Oh, yeah. It weighs nothing. <laughs> All of your if your phone hits you in the head and it hurts, it's because of the battery. It's only the battery. The battery is the thing that weighs all of the weight, right? Yeah. And and with your phone, it's not that big a deal, other than if you're, well, if you have no upper body strength, I guess. But um, <laughs> but with a car, <laughs> right? That it's like we if a car weighs less, it it's more efficient. Yeah. Right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. if we can decrease, you know, all of that is, is battery technology in a nutshell, right? We're trying to get more power for less mass and less weight and, you know, less volume and, and space and everything. So, yeah. so all of that is what makes lithium ion batteries a great candidate because it lithium isn't of in and of itself pretty low weight. You have to use a lot of it and you have to use different forms of these other materials, but it has a lot of potential uh, energy because of lithiums, you know, uh, oxidation reduction potential, you know, three to four yeah. volts is a lot of power and the materials that we've gotten to, to, to make these batteries are much, are very, very safe compared to the very early, yeah. you know, ones they, they, they work for a very long period of time. There's, there's, you know, batteries eventually are, you know, lose capacity over time, but mm -hmm. lithium is, has been observably compared to other batteries like nickel metal hydride and some of the other mm -hmm. alkaline especially primary batteries, you know, lithium is rechargeable and relatively reliably so for a very long time. They have no memory effect. They don't degrade over time very quickly compared to other batteries. They they have a ton of properties like this. Um, and it's, it's you know, they're the right answer. We're just, we're getting there, right? Yeah. Collectively yeah, yeah. as scientists, battery research is really, really important and keeps growing. And, uh, you know, that that's, uh, that's, that's about... Uh, that's the overview there, I suppose. Yeah. So we have another question. They have a new question from Shruti. Uh, graphite rod or platinum, which is a better counter electrode? Where do we use platinum? This is a very good question. I think um, both of them are good. It really, it's it's your preference. Um, I, I used platinum electrodes, counter electrodes when I was in graduate school, but having worked here for a while and just seen a variety of different research things. I actually think graphite is is very good, mostly and possibly better than platinum, simply because it just doesn't cost as much. Um, it's a huge surface area. Um, and it really the counter electrode just helps drive current uh, through your electrochemical cell. And it just can't degrade it can't, um, you know, it has to be able to do reactions fairly easily, right? If there's going to be an oxidation on your working electrode, there's got to be a counter reaction. There has to be a reduction on your on your counter electrode. So, so basically, how easy it is for the platinum or graphite rod to do that reaction is going to be another factor. But, um, but you know, the other thing I would also say is. Uh, CO2 reduction is probably the, the other main thing you'd want to think about with consideration. Like if you're doing a CO2 reduction project, do you want to have a source of carbon in your electrochemical system? But also similarly, platinum can, can be is a catalyst too. So if uh, platinum add atoms 
make its way to the working electrode that could also screw up your uh, experiment. So those are so to say which one is like better or worse, it's hard to say. There there are trade-offs between both of them that you should just consider for your um, for your experiment. But I'm I don't know I'm a I'm a believer in in graphite rods. If your experiment's very simple, um, go with the less expensive graphite rod. Yeah, and especially that small chance that platinum is infiltrating things, right? That that, yeah. that was a whole study. You want yeah. to talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah, you know about that paper. I've only know of it. You actually read it, I think. I I mean, it's, it's hard. been a while, but it's been a while. But basically, the idea is that um, because you are oxidizing and reducing things, like single individual atoms of platinum can come off the platinum electrode and make its way to the working electrode. And, and you would do something like XRD or something um, or some other technique to see whether your working electrode has platinum deposited on it. Um, what some people do to uh, overcome this problem is they will, um, they'll actually create like an isolation tube between or some kind of separation between the platinum uh, counter electrode and the working electrode. And it just makes it harder for those platinum atoms to diffuse over. But like, I know like the American Chemical Society, a lot of their catalysis or energy articles, the editors are going to be very, um, they're going to scrutinize your paper if you use a platinum electrode and you don't talk about what you did to possibly remove any platinum contamination or how did you check for platinum contamination. So, um, but that's that's basically what I know. But yeah, an isolation tube works perfectly well. Um, another thing about platinum, like it's interesting. You can also think about the mechanical parts of the of the electrode. Like platinum's a platinum's usually so sold as a wire. It can bend, but it's very like it can easily break if you yeah. like bend it too much. It can be very fragile. Yeah, you can only bend it back and forth so many times before it snaps. Yeah. yeah. And and that just happens during electrochemistry experiments. Um but graphite rods can like snap, you know, um, that's another thing, but they're also like, they're cheaper and they're, and you know, they're bigger like rods sort of say. So, uh, I just be careful with, with those things, but that's, that's my, I don't know, my take on yeah. the difference between the two. This is like the teams. battle between cyclic voltammetry and pulse techniques. CV had won. Yeah. yeah. CV is the winner of the battle Royale of what technique should be used for, you know, for, for an, an out like DC yeah. analysis or whatever. Yeah. And uh, platinum has won the battle between for counter electrodes, but graphite should be appreciated. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah, I, I mean graphite graphite works just as well in probably most cases. Yeah, I you think know? you even said the, the corrosion industry. Yeah, they use uses, graphite more. Uses graphite they use graphite way more often. Way more often. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, gra and again, it's 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 like honestly, why not? Like it's cheaper. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Big and surface it, area. If you're dealing with yeah. stuff with like like a wire has so much surface area but a full rod that's kind of porous that has a much bigger surface yeah, it's area bigger surface area and so. it's like it's easy. I, th I think the danger people don't like is that it you know graphite carbon can be over oxidized yeah. so if you're doing a really strongly reducing something on your working electrode it means that you will have some relatively strongly oxidizing something on your graphite yeah and i can understand how people that if, if that wrecked it or something you know like, yeah. okay f fine fair enough right yeah. Um, but yeah, for a lot of cases, I think graphite is probably perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Let's Chris see. says at the other end of the battery spectrum, Edison batteries are having a revival in stationary applications. I think Edison batteries are like a version of um, mm -hmm. like the lead acid batteries um, that you use in cars. So most uh, most cars, yeah. the, the battery in a car, I'm not talking about like a Tesla like or, a, or an electric car. I mean, like just regular old you know, <laughs> regular <laughs> an old gas, right, one, one of those ancient gasoline cars yeah. <laughs> that everybody used to drive that we all actually still drive. For. Yeah. Um, the, the battery inside of that is a lead acid battery. Um, and Chris, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The Edison battery is kind of like a version of that. That's just like, it's not as dangerous because it's nickel and iron and, uh, nickel isn't it's alkaline because it's nickel hydroxide and nickel oxyhydroxide and base is not, a picnic but the lead acid right now lead acid it's iron right I'm, okay. I'm talking about the edison battery is lead acid it's lead acid the, the edison battery is nickel iron 
And so it's an alkaline battery. It has only about a volt. So it's it's you have big stacks of it to get more power. That that's like what the um, car mm -hmm. batteries use. Yeah, nickel iron. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what yeah. I was saying. So basically, the lead acid. One of the downsides of it is that it, it's a ton of sulfuric acid in it, mm -hmm. which is dangerous. And well, lead is obviously pretty dangerous. So. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's it's, a, it's always been somewhat of a non-trivial problem the disposal of old, you know, lead acid batteries, and so um, nickel iron is probably a little less environmentally hazardous, I suppose. But I don't know if like cars and stuff use the nickel um, iron batteries. You say stationary applications, so yeah, I, that's cool if they're having a revival. I am an equal opportunity. Um, battery supporter so, <laughs> so yeah that's cool i love battery technology i was always been fascinated by it that's why i studied it in grad school so yeah. now barry's got a question yeah welcome back barry good to good to see you barry's asking can i use glassy carbon for a working electrode in organic solvent systems and the answer to that is yes yes you can you absolutely can. use glassy carbon in organic solvent system in fact you may find that glassy carbon works even better there than it does in aqueous yeah i feel like sometimes it catalyzes stuff pretty well yeah whereas in aqueous it like almost doesn't do anything you know? yeah yeah sometimes yeah you know? like it'll do ferrocene right I mean, yeah glassy carb yeah you can do glassy carbon the cni trial yeah in ferrocene and it works uh it works very well um you can probably use it in thf and dmso and all those stuff so yeah you can definitely use a glassy carbon working electrode and organic solvents we've, yeah we've used them before so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the it's one of the common electrodes that you use for sure mm -hmm. yeah edison batteries they are incredibly robust and can take large charge rates that's interesting hmm. I yeah i mean so can a lead acid battery that's one of the main reasons it's used for cars because mm -hmm. you know you have to you have a car uses a tremendous amount of power and and to, to to start and and to you know i know you accelerate you're using the engine and stuff but anyway the car has a pretty desizable amount of like pattern uh, power requirements and things like that lead acid battery is good at that too mm. it's interesting yeah I, I actually don't know a ton about the um like the comparisons between nickel iron and lead acid batteries um i just know that lead acid is the one that we use for cars right obviously so it's you know, the industry standard, if you will. But yeah, yeah, it's kind of cool. Let's see. There's a, there's a question from uh, Muhammad. He says, why EIS graph of copper nanoparticles is straight line rather than semicircle? Probably because you're not at a potential at which something is happening. So you're probably doing EIS at open circuit potential and you're just measuring capacitance and or diffusion if you, it's copper so i'm assuming if you have uh i suppose high well, it's copper nanoparticles so it probably would uh oxidize if you go high enough potential yeah right something like that copper just oxidizes yeah just naturally yeah you know so but also it's like if you push the potential but there's yeah. going to be you know copper to copper one plus plus an electron and then there's copper one plus the two plus and then you can yeah. just go copper to copper two plus all of those are yeah, possible different you know potentials possible. that's right so it's like if you're doing eis at open circuit potential you're probably not doing any of that and so you probably just have capacitance so if you instead make your eis set point at and i'm just i have no idea what your system is right so i'm just guessing but if, yeah. if you Some do negative potential or something yeah well if you have uh if you do eis at positive 800 millivolts i'm just making this up you're probably going to have some of those oxidation processes happening yeah and i would guess you might start to see a semicircle because that's a charge transfer process mm -hmm. and you would start seeing that so um obviously there's a little more that we would need to know um as far as uh what your system is and what's what's going on yeah um but uh but probably it's just the set point of your impedance you're probably you're probably you know i mean why you don't have a semicircle is probably because you don't have a charge transfer process occurring yeah something like that or you do but it's a very very slow very high resistive one like it looks like a straight line but maybe eventually it would curl yeah. down and so like that semicircle width is huge mm -hmm. and all and effectively semi-infinite um, so those are all possibilities that might be going on hmm. interesting 
feel like we'd also have to need to know a little bit more also about the, the complete system. Yeah, like, for sure. Just copper nanoparticles by themselves. I'm like, on what? <laughs> yeah, right. It, there's a lot of other questions about what the system is, but but uh, yeah, hopefully that is some answer as to why, some of the possibilities as to why you might be seeing what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. But, um, uh, yeah. So we acid. have all the questions from the chat. There, um, there was a question. Oh yeah, I do you want to answer the one from the yeah comment? There was a question we got on one, uh, a comment from our YouTube channel. Uh, this person just went by user PD eight SQ six QZ three R, and uh, his question is: he, he watched the video on uh, our YouTube channel about cyclic voltammetry, and he wanted to know instead of a standard redox system and, and a solvent such as like you know ruthenium hexamine or ferrocene in water with a supporting electrolyte like like potassium chloride what if you used a molten salt and nothing else so what would happen if you just had electrochemistry of a molten salt um and then he also wants to know what happens if you go from like a two electrode system to basically a three electrode system so um i would like to take a quick stab but basically if you just, uh, I did a little bit of research on some, like, when I, when I say research, I mean, like, reading just a little bit of the literature. And molten salt electrochemistry currently, like, at the electrode interface isn't really all that different than regular aqueous, non-aqueous electrochemistry with a supporting electrolyte and, and solvent. But all, it's just molten salts are at very high temperatures. And so the cell is different, the electrodes are different, like all that kind of stuff. But really what you have is you just have all these ions, instead of solvent, there's just ions in solution. So when you apply a potential or, or have charge at an electrode interface, you're still just gonna have these, you know, if it's, if it's naturally positively charged on the electrode surface, you're going to have negative charge, more negative charge adsorbed onto the electrode surface. And without any um, redox molecule, without any analyte, you know, you're just going to look at like double layer charging for the most part. But molten salts effectively act in the same way. They just have, you know, very low resistance because they're conductive salts. Um, but for my limited knowledge, that's all I can tell you is the picture itself is actually still the same between the standard redox system and the molten salt picture. You still have these interesting capacitive processes with double with the double layer. Um, in fact, the double layer may look a little interesting because you don't have the solvent molecules, but you may start having layers of anions and cations and anions and cations around whatever the conductive surface is. So you may have like multiple capacitive, you know, capacitive systems on top of each other um that uh, that would that will be the case and then um so hopefully that answers your question and then the other question you said is what changes if you're using a working electrode uh in a working in a two electrode system without a reference electrode and we get this kind of question relatively often but uh two electrode systems i would say are relatively easy to conceptually understand you are applying the potential between like point a and point b and both potential and current are between those two points. The reference electrode is actually, in a way, what makes things confusing because the reference electrode is designed as this stable reference point, and it allows us to understand what's happening at just the working electrode surface from a point where we know nothing is happening or we know that that potential is stable. So, uh, I, let's see, I'm going to just share my screen very quickly to kind of uh, somewhat illustrate this. Uh, like the last time I spoke was on nurse equation stuff. Yeah. Well, the last <laughs> Going time back to the, you... the beginning of the oh, live stream. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, hide that. There we go. Yeah, sorry. The, yeah. That was the thing. But basically, you know, you have your, in your three electrode system, you have... You know, something like this, you know, where it's like, uh, you know, counter, it's called CE, reference, RE, and then working is WE. And more often than not, three electrode system, this is like a, 
you know, you're measuring a voltage between these two. So this is like a voltmeter. That's like a little dial, little, little dial. It moves back and forth. <laughs> little tiny dial. Little tiny dial. And then this is like power. So this is like, uh, so actually this may look, a, oops, uh, this will look a little bit more like, gets rid of my thickness. So I think, I don't know, I think, I think this is sometimes the symbol people use for, for power. So, so your power is kind of between these two. And that's a three electrode system. Oh, but... you didn't connect it to the working electrode. It's connected to the cell. Oh, it's connected to the cell. Now Boop. it's like an infinite loop. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. I need to yeah, delete that and then just make this guy yeah, This go... is like pointless nitty gritty here, but. Well, no, but I also want to make sure that there's like a level of accuracy. Yeah, so of it... course. Well, you always draw it well. And then, and then like, then... oh, I connected to the glass cell. And it's like, oh, wait, cell I right. connected to the glass cell. Yeah, yeah. This is all like water or something like that. Now that's a. Uh... This is this is three electrode to fill in all the water here. Should I make this very clear? This could be an organic solvent too, but but then in a two electrode system. So let's get rid of this. So in our two electrode system, we're just kind of connecting it this way. This this just goes here. So both the power and measurement is between these two electrodes. And what commonly happens is the potential of the counter electrode is changing during the experiment. So it's changing during the experiment, which means that what the, the potential of the working electrode is not well known because the reference point that it's being referred to is changing. So you can't know it in a very, I would say absolute sense. Um, so that hopefully kind of addresses the question about, uh, you know, what if you're working in a two versus three electrode system without a reference? So hopefully that was helpful. Suddenly we got like four more questions. Okay. Oh, four more questions. Explore South Korea. Could you please tell me what is the role of, there it is, yeah. Right. Biased potential in electrochemical reduction of CO2. You should answer this one. You did CO2 reduction. I did some CO2 reduction. So I don't know what they mean by biased potential um, because the potential is inherently I mean, if they treat polarization, I, it's always like, what is the role? I mean, it's what drives the reaction. I don't know. Well, oh, yeah. Oh, it's the role of the biased potential. Sorry. Yeah, I misunderstood. The no, but I, the, I, I'm with you. I'm not sure. I mean, it seems almost like too obvious. Like if, if you mean something else, like in any, whether it's CO2 reduction or anything, the role of the potential is to drive the reaction. Yeah, yeah. To give you the driving force through which the reaction occurs. Yeah, that's so that, that's exactly right. Like in CO two reduction, you are you're applying a large negative, more often than not, a large negative potential to reduce. Like carbon dioxide is one of the most oxidized forms of carbon mm. that's just out there. And so you're trying to reduce it to something that's less oxidized. Even carbon monoxide is a reduced form of carbon compared to CO2. So the potential is that driving force to overcome the thermodynamics of, of getting the electrons and, and protons actually to convert CO2 into something, into something else. That's what the potential uh, does. It doesn't happen naturally, right? So... Hopefully that uh, and explore South Korea. If you want more uh, details, uh, please please let me know. But I hope that was I hope that was helpful. Um, what are the benefits of downside benefits or downsides? Probably yeah. Um, the different methods to determine the solution resistance. Oh, potential step current interior. I'm not sure current inter in interrupts. Probably. Current inter oh yeah, positive feedback. Yeah. Um, and so current, yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah, you're missing, yeah, yes. Um, That's okay. so, uh, well, the downsides, in my opinion, of cur um, current interrupt, current interrupt is my is, is the one I, I like the least personally, okay, and I, and I find it to be the, the least valuable or the least accurate simply because so current interrupt, the, the, the philosophy is I have my cell connected, and then if I can, if I am able to immediately disconnect the counter electrode 
what will happen is that we'll have an immediate drop. Okay. Um, in, in, in current, and then it will decay to zero, but, but it's like, there's a split second where the drop in current as a result of that disconnect is related only to the capacitance discharge. Yeah. Right. So, so you, you have a, you have a bill, you have a capacitance on your electrode. And so if I disconnect the counter electrode, I'm opening it up completely. And so all the current will drop, but before that, the capacitor on the surface will briefly discharge. And so that um, discharge capacitance can be related and you can get a, a measure was it you can get a measure of the resistance from that or something like that. Yeah. Um, but essentially you, if you want to show the reaction or the, or the equation, that would be good. Essentially the reason I don't like it is because what it necessitates is that you have the ability with your software, with your potentiostat, with everything to measure on the speed at which that capacitance is discharged. Yeah, Alex is going to draw the circuit to kind yeah. of show what happens. The problem is that that capacitance discharges so fast that it's milliseconds or microseconds or whatever. Yeah. And so what you have to hope is that, right. number one, your potentiostat and your time resolution in whatever instrument you're using can, number one, measure that fast, which is not a guarantee. Yeah. And then number two, the accuracy of the measurement at that speed is – related just to that CDL uh uh um right uh, uh yeah hold on whatever Time so current we should get rid of the question so we can see oh uh, yeah sorry I got um it. and so it's yeah so you're getting the R from this because of the the capacitor or something it's a little bit different hold on so tech tech not technically technically but um it would look a little bit more like it'd be a gap and then it would be kind yeah, of a gap. Exactly. so that gap is what you're looking at yeah so yeah and this this gap the, yeah the actually both potential so both potential step and current interrupt they both assume the same they're actually like equal and opposites of how they're approaching things yeah. it's like Current interrupt is apply a constant current and then drop it. Potential step is apply a step. Apply potential, a step. You're going in opposite directions. You're just kind of going the yeah, opposite but, directions. Yeah, exactly. So that current is a, is related to a drop in the potential because you went from whatever potential to open circuit. So there's a yeah. different. There's an e, a delta e, and a delta i. Yeah. And you use Ohm's law and you can get the resistance. Right. Yeah. So this is uh, and then so we uh, we know what the e is. Yeah. Whatever it is. That's what we cool. just applied, and then we know this delta i. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so and it goes from E to zero versus OCP. Whatever the whatever the change in the voltage is, it goes to open circuit. Yeah. 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 So yeah. so so yeah, the idea, yeah, again to kind of reiterate what, what Neil said, the idea here is that um you you charge this capacitor by holding the potential and you get this current it's constant. It's and this is a potential where there's no Faraday processes. So this RCT is very large. And then when you disconnect the RU, like the current through a resistor is instantaneous. Mm -hmm. There's no charging. So the assumption is when you instantaneously disconnect, all this decay is just associated with CDL, which means this difference has to do with RU. And Neil's exactly right. This has to do with the speed at with which an instrument is collecting data points. And the speed at which that disconnect actually happens in yeah. relation to any other internal things with a potential stat that might be hanging on to stray capacitances. That's another, like, yeah, yeah. there could be a potential, potential stat is very complex, com you know, circuitry. There could be some very slight um, capacitance or leakage pathways yeah. that are very minor and don't affect anything on a normal situation. But yeah. with this, like I need data, Super, 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 fast. super fast. And that's the only time I need it ever. Like it's, it's, it's at a, it's to the point where you have to make a lot of assumptions and hope that it's right yeah. to be able to trust that drop in current that Alex drew is exactly related to what you do. You know, you're looking for, and that's accurate. 
Yeah. I find that to be not convincing personally. And I, I, I don't know that. I, and, and, and it's like, you know, the fastest that your instrument can collect data is, you know, like a hundred microseconds. Well, maybe, it, mm -hmm. maybe it discharges in 10 microseconds. Well, you can't collect data fast enough. So now you're yeah. inaccurate there too. So it's, it's, uh, it's tricky. I yeah. don't like that one very much. Um, I personally like positive feedback. I, yeah. think, I think it's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, you're looking for where it actually starts to oscillate. Basically, you're just you're you're compensating at different amounts of uh, ohms until the you force the potentiostat to reach an oscillating condition. And yeah. when it's oscillating, you've overcompensated. So yeah. you trial and error experimentally are finding, yeah. you know, where it's bad basically, which is where the uh, the resistance is. It's kind of a way to back out the resistance. It's not really a measurement. It's more of like a it's like a teasing it out, right? Yeah. Whereas EIS, which is the one that you didn't mention, because potential step and positive feedback, that's the same thing. Basically, basically the same yeah. Thing. Um, EIS is the best, well, it's the most common, I suppose, and, yeah. and probably the best method to directly measure yeah. that because you're just doing high frequency um, pulses and you get a direct measurement. You're bypassing um, the other capacitive processes and uh, you just get a direct measurement of mm -hmm. the leading resistor which is the IRU. So, so that's a pretty easy yeah. and reliable method, relatively speaking, to get that um, to get that resistance. Yeah. I'll say one thing that I don't like about, so so one thing that's kind of bad about, I, I agree with Neil that positive feedback is actually very good. It's like you want to figure out what the solution resistance is, but really what you want to oh, do is figure out say. how much you need to compensate for. Yeah. Yep. But sometimes, uh, Actually, we didn't even realize this until later. But if you go to most literature, as well as what other other company potential stats do, is you'll measure the current. Uh, how does the current oscillate as you apply positive feedback? But really, when you use a potential step and you met and you look for oscillations in the potential, that's a that's actually much more reliable. But it's also sometimes difficult to determine, like where what what is what really is proper oscillation like yeah. okay this is a squiggly line this is also a squiggly line this is a slightly more squiggly line <laughs> and then it goes crazy i'm like well what level which, of squiggliness yeah, yeah is what a... level of squiggliness is is good for me yeah. right so no amount of squiggliness is good for you yeah that's just the reality that's kind of the that's the only problem i have with it <laughs> but yeah it, it usually works mm. um so that's so that's good so yeah that, that's a drawback i would say um, of, of positive feedback, but, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. So Phil. EIS is, is probably your best bet. To be yeah. The one that you did, that you, the didn't one you play. didn't mention. That's yeah. correct. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, hey, it looks like we got one more question Yeah, and we'll answer this and probably call it a day. Yeah. But, uh, can we convert copper oxide nanoparticles to pure copper nanoparticles? I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt it. Honestly. Um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, copper to copper oxide. I mean, is it irreversible? I, th I think you can reduce it's largely, copper oxide to copper, yeah. but I think that- It's not gonna form the same morphology. It's not gonna form the same morphology. And I think that, um, I wanna say there's actually some embedded like copper oxide, like it's not just, oh, a monolayer on the top that's oxide. Yeah, I think so, it goes pretty deep and that yeah. is probably not gonna get easily converted back to pure right to pure copper because it's like if you were to just have this like particle of copper oxide or whatever and you you try to reduce it to copper like maybe the surface yeah. you'll have some copper on the surface but it'll have a core of copper oxide still yeah because that's not in contact with solution it, like there's some depth of which it will something will happen but not like completely Could, you know and then you're assuming the morphology will remain the same which is probably not the case and then there's also just the fact that oxides and particular for copper are, are rust right yeah. i mean that's you're just well iron is rust yeah, but like yeah, yeah. like you know generally speaking oxides of of transition metals are often uh bad news right like yeah in some yeah. in some cases it's not a good you know and it depends it's c is it cuo or is it spinel is it cu was it cu304 right oh. there's there's different oh, right. oxidation states yeah i don't know if copper has a spinel like molybdenum has a spinel uh, you know, uh, lattice. So there, there's different options there, right? But the point is they're not all created equal. They're not all yeah. sort of equally reducible. Some of them are like, sometimes these oxides 
sometimes and there are, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're they go from metallic to semiconducting. Sometimes they go from metallic to completely not conductive very yeah. much. Now I think copper oxide is relatively conductive, but um, there's just some open questions there. But generally speaking, uh, I think the answer is probably not in the way that you're thinking that like my one particle just becomes, you know, from copper oxide to pure copper with just a potential. Maybe if it's small enough, you know, yeah. maybe, but, but, but uh, maybe, but I, I, I don't think it would be exactly that easy and that straightforward, unfortunately. Yeah. I, th I think guess. that you can, um, yeah, I, I think you might have to do some experiments. Like you might be able to reduce some copper oxide mm -hmm. back to copper. Um, yeah. And it's, I'm also thinking about the nanoparticle thing. Cause like I've seen people, um, I've seen some people like actually one thing I used to do, like, uh, there's an instrument called, a, a CHN analysis or ultimate analysis. It would give you the elemental ultimate analysis. Sounds it like... was called ultimate analysis. It was, it was ultimate. actually very cool. Um, but it, literally you take a sample of something. I weighed out like maybe one milligram of a sample. And then you would blow it up and then you would, it would measure the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. It was, it gave you the empirical analysis of a molecule. And for some reason, I don't know what it was, but these things consumed like copper filings. And what we would do is, you know, you, you have the copper filing, you know, when you put it in, it looks nice. It's like kind of pinkish, right? But then after the whole thing's done, it's oxidized like crazy and it's black. And we used to put the copper filings in this like furnace tube and blow hydrogen across it. Mm -hmm. And it would, it would reduce and yeah. you would actually see water dripping off of it. Yeah. Um, so you could, you could even do like a gas, you could try even a gas phase reduction of copper oxide to copper. It's just the nanoparticles, the morphology, like nanostructures are like complicated, like as Neil said. Mm -hmm. Um, so something, some things to keep in mind. Um, but, uh, I think we've given you at least a lot of thoughts and ideas with regard to reduction and conversion of copper oxide to copper nanoparticles. Yeah. So. But let us know if you're able to create them. That would be cool for us to know. Yeah, that, that that's an interesting proposition. Yeah. I think it depends on the a lot of the specifics of your experiment, of course. But yeah. 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 All right. I guess we'll wrap it up here. It's been yeah. uh, it's been more than two hours. Thank you everybody yeah. for coming and thank you for the questions. Um, I hope that we were did a good enough job answering yeah. them and <laughs> we weren't too ridiculous with our supportive electrodes and yeah jokes and things, things that's like that. that's that's what we do we can't help ourselves yeah yeah and um we will we'll try um i won't be we'll, here next week you won't be here next week um we might have a series of weeks where it's hairy yeah yeah you're, you're traveling i'll, I'll after be here that. next week yeah you will and then the week after that i might be here you won't maybe yeah i could i could i could i might still be able to log in from where you are from i'll be in grove city okay so i can still log in should be able to all right there cool. and the follow week i'll be good so i should i should be good there's, there's actually some some okay. time um hold on, let's see oh pete's got a question yeah i i think we can maybe we can answer relatively quickly yeah. how does one get good electrical connection to carbon oh fiber as well as graphite um yeah, well, the, pro oh. the problem is, yeah, it, it, it's crumbly, right? Um, yeah. So uh, you can't really clip to it with normal alligator clips because they have teeth and it'll sometimes it crunches the carbon um, and that won't work always so well. Or it depends how it, it, there's a lot of different kinds of carbon. And it's yeah. it can be brittle. Um, so they make conductive epoxies. So yeah. what, what you can do is you can take a corner of it and um and put a glob of like conductive epoxy with a metal yeah like like a, like, epoxy with, like, a, with, with like yeah like silver epoxy and you get like put a wire on it yeah and epoxy a wire and have it dangle and it's a glue right it's like a glue yeah. so that keeps the conductivity and then you can like alligator clip or whatever to like the wire that's connected mm -hmm. to it that's one option and then if you have to you can use like teflon tape to insulate part of it um otherwise or copper they, tape Copper you tape, yeah, copper there's tape copper tape, another... it's a conductive, right? Basically, Definitely. you're looking for something that's adhesive and conductive. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. make copper tape, I think there's silver tape, yeah, um, silver epoxy, right? Yeah. Glue, that, that's a little, you know, 
all of these are tricky too because it's like you know it'll, it'll affect the surface area the, that will become part of the electrode if it gets wet which is why sometimes you do like epoxy and then you wrap it in teflon tape so that it isn't as much as you can it's like insulated from solution mm -hmm. right because you know then the epoxy is part of your electrode you don't want to do electrochemistry on an epoxy parallel clamps yeah and there's um they make alligator clips that are flat we have one oh, yeah. we have one version of our like we have like electrode holders shameless plug here but like you know <laughs> sometimes you have a, you have a holder like a little it's like a rod and it has a clip and the alligator clip has teeth usually mm -hmm. but we we have like one version that has it's like a it's like a gold alligator clip and it's it's just oh, flat right. yeah it's flat. so it's just it's flat to flat plates that are sp spring together right yeah so um it depends like if you do if you're gentle enough with it on some carbon paper you can get it to kind of just sandwich it and then it'll hold it if you squeeze too hard it'll sometimes it'll crunch and you know it's again it's brittle yeah but yeah i'm familiar with this uh, carbon paper is really brittle it's a pain in the butt to connect to um it's great it's porous it's conductive and everything but it's uh, it's hard to connect to when you're using it as an electrode so uh yeah try some of those adhesive things that might help um yeah. or a flat clip or you know otherwise if it's like a fiber or like a carbon cloth you can try weaving in like a metal like a like you know what i mean like uh go in and out with a um like a silver wire to, mm -hmm. to keep it in place and s squeeze it together well and maybe wrap it so, so you can prove your connection but you can try stuff like that because carbon's a bit of a, carbon's great but it's a pain with yeah. those uh, morphologies so yeah give some of that a try yeah and uh and pete venuti just fyi i think you had a question on um that you put on on like maybe two live streams ago and i think i answered it on the last live stream so hopefully you got that uh let me know if you if you were able to get that answer i forgot there's so many questions i just forgot yeah, I just like, remember the name who, who asked who asked what yeah, yeah yeah but um it should be the answer should be there um it last you, week so the week before i think it was I want to say it was last week's. Yeah. I think. But we'll see. We'll see. I think it was last week. Because I think the week before I wasn't here. Yeah, the week before so you I, weren't there. I remember you answering the question. I, th okay. I think it was last week. So that so that'd be episode four, 14 last week. I think it was 14. This, was this is 15 this right is 15. now. So yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, all right. Anyway, like we said, uh, you know, I won't see everybody next week. So I hope uh hope you all have a good week with Alex. And then after yeah. that, we might be in separate screens yeah. for a while as we're, Alex we're will be traveling, traveling and yeah. it's uh, it's that time of year. There's a lot yes. of travel and stuff, but thank you everybody for your questions. Thank you for watching this. If you're watching afterwards, if you made it two and a half hours and 15 minutes in and uh, you know, uh, mechanical connection. Yeah. You're hoping for something chemical. I understand. Yeah. Uh, it's hard, right? Ca carbon is kind of inert. You're up against that. It, you don't, Okay. Uh, okay. Like, technic so it's technically a mechanical kind of okay. chemical. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're um, you're you're kind of stuck with mechanical options. I think for the most part. Yeah. Unfortunately, ch ch chemically bonding to glassy carbon. I don't know. Electrical connection. Also, we just to be clear, I'm I'm assuming that when you say electrical connection, you mean to the potential stat. I, I'm assuming you don't mean like, like so um, chemically bonding. Making your yeah, it. like making your catalyst on it. Yeah. That's not what I had in mind. That's a different yeah. discussion. That does work chemically and electrochemically. I'm assuming that you're referring to connecting connecting it to your potential stat cable. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought you meant by electrical connection. Yeah. Pete. So for what it's yeah. worth, if that is what you meant, I do think that probably you're stuck with mechanical solutions. Yeah. I think almost every, like we use mechanical solutions for making yeah. any electrodes. So like Yeah. I, you can't get around the arts and crafts part of electrochemistry yeah yeah there's a lot of that so okay. yeah cool all right okay. well anyway yeah, again this is our third attempt we'll try to yeah <laughs> end the live stream now yeah <laughs> so yeah thank you all very much and all right. uh we'll catch you all in uh whenever we see you again yeah next yeah. week or whenever all right bye everyone take care